pressure continues to be normal. All right, the table pressure looks good. Traveling up. Water towers can fly! Yes! Yeah. go down phenomenal. Why did not try SCE dog? Bring in SCE dog. Oh. Yikes. You bet. Incur. We don't need any more of these. Good morning, space fans. It is launch day out on the Space Coast as we have Crew 5 on a Falcon 9 ready to take a couple astronauts up to the International Space Station. John Galloway for NASA Space Flight here. Be doing some commentary with you this morning, and I am joined by a couple of my friends four hours in advance. The clock is uh, ticking down at three mi or three hours, 59 minutes, and 19, 18, 17 seconds here, ready to answer some of your questions. I got lots of five by fives in chat. I have one five by seven, which is confusing, but I appreciate you anyways. <laughs> and uh, let's introduce some of the other people that are with me here this morning. Starting with Alejandro Alcantaria Romera. How you doing, Alex? I'm doing great. Uh, it's, it's quite a nice afternoon here in Spain, but you know, I'm really excited. Another crew launch. Uh, it, it, it's always great to see people going to space. Excellent. Alex is a writer here at NASA Space Flight. You've heard his uh, voice on the streams before. And we also have, let's see here, Elisa Siegel. Elisa, how are you doing this morning? Oh, good morning. Good to be back. Three times in, what, a week and a half now? I'm surprised you guys aren't sick of me yet. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to have you here, Alicia. We will uh, be talking about the crew launch. And then out in the field, the reason I changed order there, Michael, um, out in the field today, we have Mr. Chris Gebhardt. Chris, how you doing? I am doing just fine watching our security helicopter come overhead. The sounds of launch day. That's what a security helicopter is. So all good here at Kennedy. I was very confusing because I needed to know how an alligator could get in a helicopter, but you know, you do you. Ah, well, that's because today we also have aerial security. <laughs> ah, <laughs> so not just the aquatic security, uh, it's aerial security as well for the Crew 5 launch. Who else is out there at the Cape with you today, Chris? Yeah, so with me here, but not quite on comms just yet, is Sawyer Rosenstein. Uh, so we are, we are hanging out here at the press site, and then uh, Thomas Berghardt is a uh, over with another one of our cameras at another building known as the Operations and Checkout Building, where the crew will are suiting up and will be walking out. So we'll be uh, standing by for some stuff from Thomas, maybe, on, on that front, too. And then Julia and Steven should be here a little later in the day as we get closer to launch for photography. Excellent. It is a regular NASA spaceflight party here uh, on launch day for Crew 5. Who's got a mission rundown for us this morning? I mean, clearly it's a crew launch to the ISS. <laughs> but it's a but it's a big one, isn't it, Alicia? Cuz there's a there's a really big uh, component to the to the crew flight uh, today. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to get your thoughts because we have some some pretty big, big things. Um, so four crew members overall, um, as you said, Doss, it's a crew launch to the International Space Station. This is uh, the Crew-5 mission from NASA. Uh, Nicole Mann is the commander of Dragon Endurance. Joe Cassida is the pilot. Koichi Wakata is mission specialist number one. And Anna Kikina uh, from Mars Cosmos is mission specialist number two. And some big things on this one. Uh, only one of those astronauts has flown to space before. Koichi Wakata is the only veteran. Uh, he flew on four space shuttle missions and a Soyuz flight uh, in two long duration stays up to the International Space Station uh, so far. By far the veteran of the crew. All the others are rookies. Um, and have never flown before. Uh, Nicole Mann and Josh Ka uh, Cassida were both originally assigned to the crew flight test of Starliner, but based on that uh, vehicle's um, developmental troubles that they ran into, uh, Nicole and Josh were taken off of the crew flight test and put on the prime crew for Crew 5 with Dragon. Um, Nicole Mann today will become the first woman to command a commercial crew vehicle and the first woman to command a U.S. launch and entry vehicle since Pamela Melroy commanded STS-120 and the shuttle Discovery mission to the station in October of 2007. And Anna Kakina from Roscosmos will become the first Russian cosmonaut to fly on a U.S. crew vehicle since STS-113 and the space shuttle Endeavour in November of 2002. Wow. So 
a big day all around for what this means. And this is the first time, obviously, with that statement that I just made, that a Russian is flying on Crew Dragon um, up to the space station. So we are finally back to fulfilling the whole an American on a Soyuz, a Russian on an American craft to ensure there's always a Russian and always an American on board the International Space Station as we are the two biggest stakeholders for the program. So in short, that's the brief rundown. It'll take about 29 hours to get there too. So docking will be tomorrow afternoon Eastern time if they get there. Or if we All launch right. today. Not, not if they get there. If we launch today. <laughs> if we <laughs> launch today. There. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so what what's happening right now? I mean, are the astronauts already out there? Are they getting suited up? Like where are the astronauts currently? Anyone? Yeah, so they yeah, so they are in the operations and checkout building uh, where Thomas is uh, preparing to get sued. They're going through their suit up process right now. And the next big event for them and the next big visual event for us will be um, uh, their walkout to the, uh, I almost said Astrovan. They don't use an Astrovan anymore. They use Teslas um, for the crew vehicles um, here for, for that. So they'll be getting into the, uh, into the Teslas. Are the uh, logos there centered, or are those not painted correctly? <laughs> they look fine. <laughs> <laughs> say, it's so I, crazy, uh, too, to see it in the daylight, because the last time I was looking at something like this, it was Crew 4, and it was, like, the middle of the night. It was so late when they were doing Crew 4 for this. Oh, I yeah. Gonna, I was going to say, Alicia, like, I, I wanted to sort of get your take on this, because you got to experience a crew flight for the very first time earlier this year with, with Crew I 4, did. as you were just saying. Yeah, yeah. in April. Um, it was the, uh, so I was there for the NASA Social down at Kennedy Space Center, and that was quite a roller coaster. Uh, lots of delays because they were waiting to bring back the Axiom crew. Um, if you remember at that time, there was, I don't know, winds and rains and all sorts of planes, trains, and automobiles trying to get everyone back home. Uh, no parking spots is essentially what the problem was at the ISS. Um, so that was delayed, gosh, week, two weeks, something like that. Um, but yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so exciting that morning to finally see everyone walking out those doors and hopping in those cars, heading over to the pad. And yeah, just just a breathtaking sight. That That launch was very early in the morning was it three four in the morning something like that and uh we were we were very sleep deprived but so glorious to see that and especially in just a nighttime launch is just always beautiful too with those flames so it's cool to see a daytime now on noon yeah, when you see one at night it's almost like in the sun has risen yeah. like the the light of the yeah. engines casts yeah. sharp shadows like it's so bright and uh, you can't see the rocket as well sometimes, but it's just like we've installed a new sun here at the wrong time. And then during the day, we get to see all the things like Max Q and the plume and da da da, da you know, all that sort of stuff. What, what so, you said about the sun at the wrong time, it's really fun on night launches here because some, uh, some of the birds and everything will go like, oh my gosh, it's morning. What Wait, happened? It's not. Like... A rooster crows in the background <laughs> yeah. or whatever. Yeah, exactly. You can't make a rooster noise this early in the morning. Yeah. Oh, wow. If you're just joining us, folks, again, we are here almost four hours in advance, three hours, 51 minutes now, covering Crew 5. We're doing what we normally do here on the NASA Space Flight streams. You can ask us some questions, tag us in chat at NASA Space Flight, or just be like, question. Um, actually, that won't work. You do have to tag us in chat. And uh, we're also going to be reading some super chats as well. We'll just be going through, filling up the four hours here as the astronauts prepare to board the rocket. They are not on it yet. But uh, we will be here hanging out with y'all as we work towards the launch. Let's see here. We can start off with a couple of quick super chats right here. One is from Musical Wolves. Hey, Musical Wolves. Good morning. And it's, does Dragon have a Russian translation? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, like no, uh, Dragon does not have Russian uh, markers on it, just the same way that the Soyuz does not have English translations, to my knowledge. Right, Sawyer? Yes. The, so, yeah, the Soyuz does not have any English translations. It is up to the people who launch on them to know the language, and um, all of the sort of spoken, the main spoken languages on the ISS are are known by by the crew. So Russian and American are uh, Russian and American. Let me try that again. Russian and English are the two primary languages that all of the astronauts need to know to operate when they can, can when they talk to ground control. So um, Anna will know English and likewise um, uh, uh, Rubio, uh, Frank Rubio, who just launched on the Soyuz on MS-22, knew, knew Russian. 
Right. So they don't uh, they don't have like I guess bilingual labels or anything like that. You sort of have to learn the language of the craft that you're flying on, right? Exactly. Exactly. All right. I don't like. I'm not going to trust Google Translate and type in like dragon and see what it becomes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I you don't know, even recognize you... these characters, so I can't even say it out loud. So right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, good question. Always good to see you there, Musical Wolf, so early in the morning. Uh, Patrick Stewart. I'm going to assume it's not that Patrick Stewart. But, uh, I so why want is there to a... believe it is. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> For, like, briefly, I was going to try to read it in his voice, but I cannot. I am not that great of actor. Uh, why is there a military vehicle there? I've never noticed it before. A military vehicle here. What are we looking yeah. at? Oh, oh, at with, the crew walk with the rollout cars. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, th that is their protection. Um, this is th we take astronaut protection very, 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 very seriously, especially for our governmental missions like this one, up to a major national asset like the inter an international asset like the International Space Station. Um, so th they will ride with them to protect them just in case. Um, oh. and, and security is very, very, very tight. Like if, if this morning, if Thomas would have gotten ill this morning, he and I could not have swapped out because security clears the names well in advance of those who go to walk out. And if you forget a badge, if you forget a supplemental ID, you're not getting close to them at walk yeah. out. So we really, really, really protect them here. Is there They've even got a helicopter out here. Also, hi, everybody. Oh, hey, Thomas. Hey, Thomas. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> Good. Hey, Just looking at some Teslas. You might hear a helicopter every once in a while. Excellent. Are you over there uh, at the crew rollout, it sounds like? I sure am. I am bringing you the camera view you're seeing now, and we are patiently waiting for the crew to walk out in their suits. Uh, we should also get to see their families come out in a bit and say goodbye to them before they make the commute for a six-month stay on orbit. Very cool. All right. I was going to ask, and I don't know if anybody will know the answer to this. Has there ever been an incident where the escort had to do anything? And I'm envisioning like no. a national lampoons thing where the guy's like yeah. driving down the road and he's <laughs> lost and he's driving up to the 39A or whatever. Like he's just his map is upside down or something and security like swarms him at 39A. But uh, there's never been an incident where we're that we know of, I guess, that security's had to like tackle somebody walking up to the rocket or something. Not for crew. Uh, and not when oh. crew was involved, um, but there have been instances. Um, so when you're media, you get given very, very, very specific instructions on what you are not allowed to do. Okay. And and the restrictions of like when you get your badge and you're allowed to drive yourself to the press site, exactly what what roads you have to be on, what you cannot do while you while, while you're en route there, and if you violate that and they see it and they will see it, they will come get you. Um, and there have been a few instances where people have deviated from the route and security arrives at the press site and takes their badge and escorts them off base. They, uh -huh. We take this very seriously here. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Well, don't do that. Uh, you just stand wherever you are and watch the rocket, okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Good. Yes. No worries, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Musical Wolves with another question. When was the last daytime crew dragon? Uh, Axiom. Earlier this year was the last one. And, and, and that's a good point that, that's being brought up in the back channel, too. You'll notice that the private missions don't have the security. Because you'll note very, very clearly that I said the governmental missions ah. have the security, but the private ones do not. So, like, you didn't really see this for, um, for Axiom earlier this year um, or, or, or things like that. But um, just wanted to clarify you know, that, too. The other so, point to talk about that, yeah. though, Chris, is the private missions also don't suit up here. Exactly. They suit up at that building that, that's basically at 39A, so they have less of a drive. And also, when we follow this convoy, especially with NASA's cameras, as they get to the pad, you'll see the security kind of peels off, and all that's left are the actual uh, Teslas carrying the astronauts and their closeout crew. The security peels off at the gate at the pad mm -hmm. perimeter. Right. All right. Let's see here. And just to close it out, Bullseye144 has become a Capcom member, joining the membership program there, getting some of the cool perks that we have with the membership program, the pre-released videos, behind-the-scenes information, and that sort of stuff. Bullseye, enjoy your membership. And I, I guess Chris Lemire? Let's go with Chris Lemire there. Also becoming a Capcom membership. We appreciate you alls support there. And enjoy all of the benefits that are conferred by membership or whatever. I guess that's a thing, right? Uh, it let's is. see here. <laughs> I, I've, I've, got a good, I've got a good point while we look for another question, though. 
Um, and, Go for and Alicia, it. I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in your in, in, in what this sort of, you know, what, what your view on this is, too, sure. um, because we mentioned that Nicole uh, Mann is the first woman to command a U.S. launch and entry vehicle since October of 2007 when Pam Melroy commanded uh, Discovery on STS-120. That that the last time a woman commanded a U.S. launch and entry mission, it also went to the space station where they met a female commander of the space station. And when Crew Dragon docks tomorrow, Commander Nicole Mann will shake hands with Commander Samantha Cristoforetti on the space station. That that's only happened one other time in history where two female commanders have met each other on board the International Space Station. That's a that's a pretty good I mean, like we're we're not I mean, we're there in terms of like, you know, the the distribution of the astronaut office in in the US, um, you know, in in terms of that that gender spread. But that's a pretty big moment to say it's only happened twice. And certainly also within um, the distribution on these capsules, too. The past couple, it's been 50 50. Also, one other thing that you haven't mentioned yet about Nicole Mann, she's also going to be the first indigenous woman from NASA in space as well. So oh, another that's right. kind of cool milestone for, for her. But absolutely, I think, you know, representation is so important. And I love actually, I was seeing some things online. Um, Samantha Cristoforetti brought her Barbie doll <laughs> in space. Yeah. And so she actually has like a little mini me floating around next to her. Uh, just, you know, just to try to get, you know, young girls interested in, in STEM and what she's doing. Such really cool, you know, pictures that I've seen of that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. It's very important, I think, to be able to see that sort of thing. Um, certainly when I was younger, you know, watching some of the shuttle things, I was, I always thought, you know, people like Sally Ride and, you know, all of those early astronauts, Mae Jemison, um, were so cool, but there were so few of them kind of still. And, and really now it's so wonderful to see such more balance, really. Um also, something about Anna Kikina, um, she's actually one of very few female cosmonauts from the Roscosmos side. Uh, Isn't she only the third or something like that, Alicia? Yeah. There, well, I don't, I don't know exactly how many there have been, but um, I read something that said that there's only about 25% of the applicants for Roscosmos are female. So it's very interesting. And I, I'm kind of like a history buff. I know that during um during the space race so that the very early era really with um the russian soviet i should say space program um women were really actually kind of seen as equals as men back then and very much different you know as it was here in america where we didn't have yeah. women of course you know we had of course the stories of the mercury 13 and betty skelton um but they were not really allowed until the 70s obviously with the the shuttle programs and opening up the other positions um, but back then, I mean, women were street cleaners and doctors and engineers, and they did all of these different positions. Their brains and their muscle powers were really just, you know, put to the test in Soviet um, society. Um, today, I, I don't know exactly. I think things might be, you know, the same, different. I'm not really sure over there how things are. But it is interesting to see that it's so, so few, only about a quarter of all these applicants. Whereas here in America, I think it's it's still not you know, a lot, but definitely more yeah. women are applying in our program. And uh, and just to hit the the, the point for, for Russia there, um, uh, Anna will be the fifth uh, female cosmonaut to have flown as part of the Soviet or Russian program after Valentina Tereshkova, Svetlana uh, Savitskaya, Yelena Kondakova, and Yelena Sorova. Um, so she will be the fifth. Wow. And she will be well. the third... Russian citizen to go to the ISS, the mm-hmm. second one to go as cosmonaut, and also the second one to do a long duration space flight. And on that same note of female astronauts, I will point out this is also going to be the second time, uh, you know, on that on that um, uh, shuttle mission back in in two thousand and in two thousand and seven, uh, they had Pamela Melroy and and uh, Peggy Whitson on station, but there were other two female astronauts on station. So that was the first time four uh, female uh, astronauts were in space. And today, once Crew-5 launches, that should be the case as well, because there will be Anna and Nicole, and then there's Samantha and Jessica on station. So that's going to be four female astronauts in space, which, 
you know, I, I know people like, uh, it doesn't really matter that much because, you know, it, it kind of does matter because when, when, does, when yeah. you're talking about this is the, the second time when, you know, when, when it is man, it's like, pff, that's happened many, many times, right? It's like, so you, you don't even just count it because it, it, it happens all the time. Whereas this is just like the second time. So yes. it does matter. And it- and and actually, um, what you said too about the, the number of women in space. Um, uh, so there will be the four um, who are on board the International Space Station, but Liu Yang is also on board the uh, oh, right. space station. So there will be five once Crew Five lifts off. Yeah, there will be I, five women in space at the same time. You're totally right. I totally forgot about this Chinese space station. I'm so sorry, Agent Will. <laughs> will probably uh, beat me about that, <laughs> but but yeah, you're you're totally right. So that will be actually the first time five five female uh, space flight. You know, because the the Chinese are like taikonauts or something. Yes. Uh, but you know, female <laughs> all, participants in space yeah. flight. I guess. Uh, yeah, all will all works for the same thing: astronaut, cosmonaut, and taikonaut. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Let's see here. I'm going to see if I can't grab a couple of uh, normal questions here. N- normal questions. Just questions where we've been tagged in chat to, at NASA Space Flight. Starting off with, where is Artemis Run right now? We are not live today for Artemis 1, correct? Artemis 1 is a different thing. This is Crew 5 today. That's true, but I can see it. <laughs> oh, you can see it? <laughs> but, but, um, but yes, we are not here for Artemis 1. No, we'll be back okay. for that in November. Yeah, yeah, and that is, uh, NASA did announce that they are not going for the October windows for Artemis mm-hmm. 1 there. They are going for November windows for Artemis 1. But today, we are here for Crew-5 Codex to watch a Crew-5 take a couple astronauts up to the International Space Station, not Artemis 1. Artemis 1's rocket is still back in the VAB. Let's see. Oh, which dragon, which named dragon, I guess, is uh, flying the mission oh. today? Endurance. It's flying for a second time. It previously flew on on the Crew Three mission on November. I think it it landed, well, splashed down in May, I believe, and yep. and that was that was a, 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 a another rotation mission to the ISS Crew Three, and then it's flying for for this one again. So this is actually kind of a rookie uh, capsule compared to others like Endeavor. Endeavor has flown three times already. <laughs> but yeah, and speaking of rookies, uh, the booster is also a rookie. Apart from the from three of the four astronauts uh-huh. on board, the booster is also a rookie. It's flying for a first time, B-1077. So yeah, it's it's a new booster. It's not that uh, NASA imposes these things. It's just normally just SpaceX sometimes just introduces uh, new boosters, and it's sometimes nice to have new boosters in in kind of the fleet. Uh, but they are definitely like they, they they could definitely fly with a with a previously flown one. I believe they do not fly boosters with a whole lot of missions on on their backs. So that's probably the reason why they're doing a new one because right now the fleet is entirely busy with with like many many flights on their backs right now. So that yeah. that might be the reason why all right let's see here so uh there with your question noah green it is dragon endurance that's what i already say right it's dragon endurance like i think that's what we say yeah yeah okay yes cool. indeed Whew. all right uh there was a question in here about that weird tank that is on the uh, right-hand side of the rocket. And it's almost sort of a weird thing because we see 39A on the left-hand side of the shot. We see the the tower, we see the water tower over there, the sort of lightning rod up on the top of it, and the rocket to the right of the little tower. And then we have on the right-hand side, the starship tower and the crane in that big shiny tank sort of in the middle of the frame there. Um, Do we know what the big metal tank is specifically for yet? It certainly looks like to be related with cryogenics. It's a, like a double shell kind of uh, tank, and it's I've and I've speculated. Yeah, uh, it it does look like the ones that they built at a starbase, only larger. Uh, it's 18 meter diameter interior, so like the interior diameter is 18 meters, whereas the other ones at a starbase are like nine. So it's 
as double as wide. Um, so m what I've been thinking all this time is it's probably going to be for, for liquid oxygen just because of the location right. it is in. We haven't seen any pipes. Uh, initially, we were thinking they were going to use the same oxygen sphere that they use for Falcon and and all of those flights that, that they used before, like Shuttle and Saturn. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't seem like there's any pipes going all the way out there to, to the from, from that tank all the way to the Starship pad. So it's more likely that that it's going to be for, for liquid oxygen. And there's, there's even some coolers and all that stuff that we have already seen at a Starbase that's, that's already there as well. Gotcha. So that's one of the cool things about 39A here. Uh, we have Dragon that's going to fly from it, like for Crew-5 today. But they are continuing to work towards launching starships from here as well. That's the huge tower on the right-hand side that sort of dwarfs the tower on the left-hand side. Uh, that is the scale for starship. And you can actually see the beginning of the orbital launch mount there. Those little short sticks between the yellow yeah. crane and the tall tower, those are the uh, pilings or, I guess, foundations legs, whatever you want to call it, for the orbital launch mount that we have <laughs> not seen uh, carried out there yet, but that may be happening sooner rather than later. There's there's a few comments uh, in the chat, because, hey, I read the chat, yep. and they're talking about a water tank. This is not a water tank. Oh, jeez. Believe me. <laughs> because this type of construction is not that of a water tank. Now, there is indeed a certain tank that they have built a little bit more up north near the now liquid methane uh, tank, uh, that does seem to be kind of a, a water tank of sorts. We kind of cover that on the flyovers. Hello, we do those. <laughs> uh, so if you if you want to see some of our speculation into this, you can go to uh, to the previous one that we did like a month ago, uh, where we already talked about this, uh, where we went over, hey, there's like another tank they're building a little bit more up north that kind of looks like it is to be a water tank. I, I remember Jack being like, oh, I can't believe I can, I'm going to say this. It might be a water tank or something. Uh, but but yeah, uh, that's that's sort of our thinking. It kind of looks just because of the, of the of, it, it's not a double shell kind of tank. Right. So it, it, it it's more akin to the to the one that we saw for water tanks at Starbase, even though that one uh, it, it it was a mess, and yeah, there's a long story about that. But yeah, yeah. we're Look gonna go back to Crew Five, though. Yeah, here we go. Um, this is coming from the press side over there. We've got the flag, and it's actually the American flag and the Crew Five flag, the Crew Five patch on it there, and that big multifunction display showing that we are three and a half hours away from the launch. And I bet you that Michael made this match up before switching to it. Because the clock that you see on the video almost, I mean, exactly matches our clock in the upper left-hand corner. Well done, Michael. Uh, let's see here. Can oh. we talk about that patch real fast, how cool it is? Have you guys seen that Crew 5 Dragon logo? Yeah, absolutely. It's a fire-breathing five-shaped dragon. And it like kind of spins off into the, the commercial crew program colors and like the capsule and everything, but... It's cool. It's just like, got some cool like anime vibes going on there. <laughs> I think Even somewhere we Texas one was super cool as well. Oh yeah. Which, which one? They so, so for 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 NASA missions, SpaceX has their own patches as well, and and they have one with like the the crew looking up to the to the crew dragon. I'm sharing that on on the back channels, uh, but it's too big, so it's processing right now. Uh, there you go. It's it's really cool. It it's like it's another one that that really I don't know. It catches my eye at least. Excellent. It looks like we still have the uh, Teslas lined up outside of the astronaut prep room. Those are those. See the NASA logos on those two oh. pillars in the background. Speaking of Pamela Melroy, she's there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's the one with the coffee. <laughs> the one with the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's her. She is the current associate administrator of uh yes, yeah, she, she's the current associate administrator of NASA. So there we go. Nice. There you go. I wonder if they are uh, do we know what time they're supposed to walk out there? I don't know. Did uh, you all have a like a schedule schedule supposed events. to be right around 8:30 local time, so should be any minute. Yeah, should be happening now. Nice. Hey Sawyer, I, by the way. She's right next to Hello, Dust. 
Okay, so uh, we will be watching for the astronauts to uh, be walking out the doors there. We shall see that shortly, hopefully. Here's another cool long-range shot with the dragon, the crew dragon on the pad. Here's a not long-range shot. Thanks, SpaceX. Um, or NASA or whoever of the dragon on the pad. But again, that is Dragon Endurance. That is what will be carrying the astronauts up to the International Space Station today when they launch in about 3 hours and 30 minutes. And uh, just to go over something, because I know people, some who are joining us are probably wondering, too, uh, ascent abort corridor weather is good to go. Um, there are no downrange weather constraints, and weather at the Kennedy Space Center is a um, is a forecast is forecast to be very very favorable. Uh, Core on 90%. countdown. T minus three hours and twenty nine minutes. Lyo seals have been removed, and installation is complete. A little bit ahead of schedule. Well, sounds like we're we gonna can... get some uh, countdown audio. <laughs> that, well, well, yes, but also, man, what a great first. Countdown audio to have that just says a little bit ahead of the timeline. That's great. Uh, let's keep <laughs> not something we've let... been hearing too much with the audio. Yeah, I know. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I know. Wah, wah. Uh, but but uh, yeah, but ascent abort corridor weather up the U.S. and across to uh, Ireland is all good, and weather here at the Cape is not anticipated to affect liftoff whatsoever. Okay, and that's something, uh, well, I'm going to, not maybe special for crew launches, but uh, remember, with a crew launch, the Dragon is actually able to pull itself to safety in case of an anomaly with the rest of the rocket, right? And so it's not just the weather here at the launch pad when you're launching crew, you actually have to look at the weather downrange, where the Dragon capsule would end up if it needed to abort at some point early or, or mid in the launch, I guess you could say, right? So it's mm -hmm. not just a beautiful day out here at the Cape. You do have to look the direction the rocket's going out there into the Atlantic and make sure that you don't have a huge storm cell or something where your capsule may abort into a storm. You have to pay attention to more than just the weather here at the Cape, which is what you're saying, right, Chris? Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. Let's see it here. Here's one from Chris asking, where can I watch it from today? I imagine all around the Space Coast you'll see this go, especially if the weather holds with the uh, little puffy clouds like we see right now. But public viewing locations, uh, do we know if Playa Linda is open today? Uh, Playa Linda <laughs> is usually... So Play Playa Linda generally stays open for Falcon launches. Um, we're gonna, Julie, Julie's going to check for us real quick on, on today cool. specifically. And Cooper but tweeted that Playa Linda is open. Playa Linda is open. There you go. Okay, I'm so Playa not, Linda I'm is about to say that. <laughs> Okay. Excellent. So, so, so there you go. Playa Linda or any park in Titusville. Yep. Yeah, Playa Linda is the uh, beach up to the north of the launch pad. It's a park. Uh, I guess it's a state park, isn't it? Is Playa Linda a state park? A National Seashore State Park. One of those things. There's a gate and there's like a $10 entry fee for vehicle last time I was there. Uh, maybe it's $15 it's now. That, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. Uh, but Playa Linda is a great viewing location to see uh, Falcons go from 39A. You can also see them from the port. The port's a little bit far away, but all the way up there, once the rocket gets into the sky, you'll see it from all over. But there are a couple of viewing locations where you can see it after it takes off if you're down at the port. And then, like Chris said, anything over in Titusville. So there's a couple parks, like Space View Park and stuff like that, aptly named. Uh, over in Titusville, they do tend to get a little bit crowded, especially for the more interesting launches like Crew. And you can see it from uh, anywhere over there at Titusville as well. Now, like I said, you'll see it from wherever after it takes off, assuming that we don't have a bunch of clouds. Um, you will see it from all over the Space Coast. But if you want to see the rocket on the pad as you wait, Playa Linda or one of the parks at Titusville is going to be the next, or your best option there, I guess is the way to say that. There's also some great pullover spots along US-1 as well that has a great view of 39A. Excellent. All right. Where's, where is US-1? Is US-1 the one that goes north and south? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I guess that makes sense. Let's see. I will continue to grab some questions, but there you go, Chris. Hopefully that, uh, that helps you out. The person asking the question's name was Chris. Um, here's a question. How many flights are the Merlin 1D engines rated for? And that's a Ooh. question mark. SpaceX doesn't release that information, do they? No. I mean, they, they, they've, they never really talked at the beginning about like, oh, you know, there's a massive difference in how we built the engines versus how we built the the boosters themselves, um, but they have never truly said like how many times they're rated to ignite. I, I, I would imagine 
based on how this sort of works in rocketry to, to in general, that they are rated for like X number of starts before they need an inspection of some yep. kind. And then they have to be inspected and then they're rated for X number of ignitions uh, again. So, uh, cause I know that's how they do it with the RS um, uh, 25s for, um, for the SLS is they're rated for X number of ignitions before you'd have to pull them to inspect them. So, yeah, makes sense. The, uh, the cop out answer there, Fernando is enough. The Merlin Windies are rated for <laughs> enough flights uh, because they're on the rocket here today. Of course, this is the first flight of the booster, but I don't think we know. Like they could have like reflowed an engine. Do they do that? I don't know if they do that. D- yeah, they can pull in mix and match engines. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, but, but they, they don't. Can. And, and you, have you noticed that we don't do as many static fires as we used to also? Um, we do them obviously for things like crew, but when we see a static fire happen, it may usually be because an engine swap happened. Mm-hmm. And I think they sense. actually had to do that with this one. They were having an issue with the thrust vector control actuator. Um, one of them, they, they were saying in the press conference, was mm-hmm. performing, as they say, out of family. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, and um, they had to replace it with a new unit. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing that kind of helps to move the engine and making sure that it's heading in the right vector to make sure that uh, the nine Merlin engines work together. In family. In family. In yes. family, yes. yes. <laughs> in, 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 in other words, the sensors went, uh-oh, black sheep, black sheep, black <laughs> sheep. <laughs> You're out of here like the weakest link for the uh, launch, I guess. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to keep going with some technical questions here. We'll do a theme question round with technical questions about uh, Falcon 9 Core and Dragon. countdown. T minus three hours and 23 minutes. The displays are configured for crew ingress on schedule. Well, cool. Thank you and for configuring the displays there. And core is crew operational resource, uh, cr- crew operational resource, or something like that. Um, oh gosh, of course it's an acronym. It's an acronym. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the few acronyms uh, SpaceX actually uses in that regard. But but it's basically the 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 primary person for makes for, sense for, for crew. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> look at this. Yeah. Okay, there was a question about this since we have this shot really quickly. Uh, Toby Fair asked, what are all the patches for on the cars? And there you can see the patches on the windshield of the car. That's like uh, the old school World War II bombers where they would paint the the things on the nose, right? Those are all the missions that car has flown. I guess the car didn't fly the missions, but supported, right? (laughs) Exactly. Go ahead, Thomas. Go, Thomas. Yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, me and, me and Steven were just looking because we noticed there's an extra patch between Demo 2 and Crew 1. They just have both mission patches from Demo 2 on there. So the NASA patch and the SpaceX patch are both there. But then you have Crew 1, Crew 2, Inspiration 4, Crew 3, Axiom 1, Crew 4, and Crew 5. I guess at some point after these uh, Teslas support enough launches, you're going to have to rely on the full self-driving because you won't be able to see out the windshield. You won't be able to see. <laughs> You'd think they put them on the back or the side or something like that. Like, come on. I'm pretty sure there's a Florida law about obstructing your view out the front of your your vehicle. Maybe they'll just wrap them around the side window. So after they fill the bottom of the front up, I believe uh, we had some patent and just start walking out. We might be getting astronauts soon. Ah. (laughs) All right. Well, Thomas, uh, hop in. Like, if if you see them start to walk, Thomas, hop in and let us know that uh, they are walking out. Just start screaming. By the way, to go back for half a second to the previous question, Core is the crew operations and resource engineer. Ah, that is who, like when they say core on main or whatever they say, what do they say? Core on something, right? Um, Yeah. The crew operations and resource engineer, the person who is speaking as core. And like we said, of course, it's uh, an acronym. The doors are open. Yeah. Oh, fancy. Can can we just point out how all those doors just together perfectly moved in sync with each other to open? You think like it's like end. three people with key fobs and they all, okay, three, two, yep. press. Or... <laughs> That's exactly what it was. <laughs> I mean, it's just their I can't they confirm that there was literally a pad ninja that told them when to open the doors. <laughs> I wonder how many times they rehearsed that one. <laughs> <laughs> they Synchron- just sit on the synchronized side. door opening for the astronauts. Minus three hours and twenty minutes. Advanced team is complete. Crew are are they're ready for crew arrival and crew are walking out of the ONC room now on schedule. Here they are. There you go. Sounds like we've got some audio on this feed too. 
do indeed. Yeah, like a generator. From uh, from left to right, it's Anna, Josh, Nicole, and Koichi. These guys have to be so excited right now. Their first flight, those three. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm not sure if y'all can hear what we're saying with the uh, generator noise there. I, I think we're trying to hear what they're saying, but uh, it is super loud out there, it sounds like. And this, this is coming up on one of my new absolute uh, favorite traditions where after the astronauts get into uh, the Teslas, their families go up to the windows and are, and are permitted time to, to talk to their, to their loved ones, their, their spouse, their, their parent um, and everything. And I, I really, really love that new tradition that's been started because I think it really hits home you know, the, the fact that we're all here, we're excited, they're excited, it's about to go do a mission, but the familial aspect to that really grounds it in the safety and, you know, why we have the systems that we do to keep everyone safe, because it's ultimately about bringing them home to those people in six months again. Yep, that's actually, a, that brings up a great question here as the astronauts before boarding the uh, Teslas to ride out to the pad there, uh, talk to friends and family there on the other side of the rope. What sort of health requirements or, or safety for health is there? Like cold and flu, do they stay away from people for two weeks? Are they allowed to hug their family here? Are they gonna get into the vehicles and then have the glass between them? What do we expect to see here in terms of uh, making sure an astronaut does not carry, you know, a flu virus up to the ISS or something like that? <laughs> Yeah, so the astronauts are put into quarantine um, prior to launch. They are quarantined for about two weeks, which is well outside of the incubation period of the stuff that you would be concerned with, like cold, flu, coronavirus, things like that. Um, they're, the, the people who are allowed to interact with them and see them and get close to them also have to pass those medical checks as well. Um, although they themselves largely do not have to be quarantined, but they do have to pass certain health checks. So um, those sort of standard procedures that that we use to make sure that we don't accidentally transport something up is what's used here. Yeah, and, makes um, sense. And, and in the past, we have both seen the astronauts roll down their windows to talk to their family, and also we have seen some not roll down the window. Uh, uh. So I don't know if there's a hard and fast rule about that or if it was just personal preference uh, because it's a little hard to, to to really know if that was a rule or personal preference because um, we, we, we used to do this only during the pe coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so, you know, rules were a little bit <laughs> tweaked during that, might you say. Yeah. Um, and real quick, Chris, uh, the license plates, we can see the license yes. plate on the rear Tesla here is blast off. Love that. With a five for the S for crew five. Yeah, the Could other one looks like it might that? be. No, the other one. Well, yeah, I guess so. Maybe the, the, the other one is blast like off. Yeah. yeah, Thomas, uh, when they go by, see if you can read all the plates. Like, I wonder if they all say blast off, but they replace different letters with numbers or whatever. I guess they could all be the same. Like, and what's cool about this is, and I, I love this day because I love the energy and the flow of what of what we get here at the space center because like. Thomas is there, and then as soon as they start moving, like I stand up and I go to our movable camera here, like to get ready for that shot of them coming around the corner and, you know, about to drive by the VAB before our other new camera assistants can catch them, Das. Ah, all right. We need some of those. You see those stools the photographers have? We need to get Thomas a stool. <laughs> <laughs> So you. anyway, <laughs> gigantic so anyways, platform. Like, yeah. <laughs> Wait, anyways, hey, I, I, I've seen cranes around here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anyways, y'all, we've got the astronauts. They have boarded the Teslas here. They're beginning to, uh, they're waiting to do the drive out to 39A. The astronauts going on crew five are in these white vehicles here. And uh, they should start rolling out soon. We usually get a, them from a bunch of different angles. We get aerial shots from the helicopter. We get chase vehicles. We get all sorts of different stuff. We'll see what we get today. Um, we also have our own cameras over there at the press site that they should be rolling by. But we are coming up on three hours and 15 minutes before the launch of Crew 4. Next step is for them to make it out to the pad and uh, climb that tower and board the Crew Dragon Endurance so they can get ready to go out to the International Space Station.
Let's see here. Okay, there's the window down like we were talking about. Looks like the front sometimes two windows the families. are up. Yep, go yeah, on. One, one thing that I will point out, sometimes the families themselves also quarantine uh, just to be able to to stay near the, the, the astronauts. It's, it's also one of the things that they usually do as well. Uh, and here we go. And they're rolling. T-minus three hours and 15 minutes. Crew are beginning their transport from the ONC room to the pad right on schedule. It's not like the helicopter flew over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And there they go. They have just a couple minute drive here to go from the building where they get suited up and prepared over to the launch pad. And we're going to see them going the entire way. And what I love is the chase car that they have that goes uh, contra flow, like so that they can get like the racing view oh, yeah. of, them, of them headed to the pad on uh, State Road 3 here. They have like a camera car that drives on the other side of the median going like the wrong way against traffic. I assume they close that road down completely while the astronauts are rolling. Uh, I believe they have a, a security. Well, the astronauts have a security escort and I believe the chase car does too. To, yeah, to clear. Sense. I think when you see a wider view, you can see the chase car and cars diving out of the way as the uh, security chase car is, uh, uh, Either... is, is approaching, shall we say. <laughs> Either Thomas hopped in one of the vehicles here, or this is the uh, view from the chase car. And right now they're behind them until they get out onto the uh, the big main road. And then I imagine they're going to take the other side and get the like, you know, you can see in the side of the window with the astronauts in the vehicles as they drive out to the pad. I just imagine yeah, Thomas like pulling onto the roof of a car. This <laughs> is like holding on tight. Let's go. <laughs> like one hand with the camera, and the other hand like on the roof rail or something. I got it, like, guys. I got it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> going above and beyond for the shot here here we go wow they have helicopter shots and all that sort of stuff here so cool and what and what i love is there comes a moment when we then get to see where they are based on where the helicopter is as it approaches us oh yeah it's like they're carrying a balloon except it's a helicopter yeah you can tell where they are because you can look up and see the helicopter following them. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see here. While we're doing the rollout, we will uh, wait on some of the things. There you can see the vehicle has the other side blocked off. They're getting onto the right-hand side. You can see the security vehicle parked across the intersection there, stopping cars from going. I imagine this is where the chase car is going to peel off and be on that bottom part of the road so they can get the shots of the astronauts as they roll. I guess if you were in the other lane right next to them, you'd be too close. But uh, they are rolling out to 39A up... Oh, you know, I don't know the name of that road. What's the name of that road? Saturn Causeway. Saturn Causeway, thank you. Uh-oh. Got a couple of hiccupy frames. They need to check their uh, pack and make sure the USB modems are online. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Maybe we should offer to put a pack in uh, one of those helicopters for them so they get a stable signal. Chris, you down? Yes, I'm down. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so they're turning on, I guess that was the uh that was the road like driving in and now they're turning on to the road that has the VAB off in the distance, right? Yes, yeah. So this is now turning on to turning State, on Road, to State 3. Road 3. Right, that was the NASA Causeway. Yeah. yeah, gotcha. And there they are. That's a big road. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not used to, to those big roads, to be honest. I mean, it's literally like the Jurassic Park road. Like, when you turn on that road... And you're sort of going the way the convoy is going right now. You look off in the distance and you see the VAB, and it feels yeah. like these big gates are opening, and you're walk, you're going into like Rocket Wonderland or whatever, and you drive. And you big drive for minutes. Dinosaur, exactly. In the it VAB. Is. <laughs> oh no! Don't call it a dinosaur. Yikes. Um. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean it like that. I just meant it's a monstrous, beautiful thing. <laughs> it is. Uh, you're like driving down this road, and you think it's close. Like you don't have a sense of scale the first time you see it, and you keep driving. And you get closer, and you keep driving, and you get closer, and you keep driving. There it is, actually. Look, you can see yeah. the VAB off in the distance. 
Um, but you just keep driving up this road and the VAB gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you're like, when are we going to get to this thing? It is quite the experience to, uh, you know, be on the bus tour or be on a NASA social bus or be, you know, driving yourself in because you're accredited as press or whatever and see this building off in the distance as you drive up the, uh, the road approaching the VAB. You know, what's even cooler is standing right across the street from the VAB and waiting for a helicopter to get bigger and bigger and bigger because astronauts <laughs> are coming. Because that's where I am right now. I'm standing on the side of the road. I don't need a ladder to be here. Nice. And I get to wave to astronauts. So that's my exciting part of the day. Do you have like a sign that says like, take me with you or anything like that? No <laughs> signs no. today. Just, no just, signs. My, just my smiling face waving. <laughs> okay, excellent. <laughs> And I see the helicopter. <laughs> nice. So again, folks, this is the rollout. The three white vehicles, those Teslas in the middle of the convoy, contain the astronauts that are headed out to the launch pad 39A for their Crew-5 launch up the International Space Station in just about three hours. They are headed out to the pad as we, I guess, talk about them heading out to the pad right now. Yes, basically. Yeah. So basically, they just passed um, SpaceX's production facility where they build all the towers for Starship and everything um, and where Hangar X is and their refurb facilities out there. So they have passed there. And here comes the helicopter now. So I am going to get ready to track with our ground camera here as well. Excellent. And that's uh, the SpaceX facility over there is on Roberts Road. Isn't that uh, what we cover in the Correct. flyover videos a lot? Exactly. That's it. Excellent. Where they keep building towers that they don't have an obvious place to put. So yes. <laughs> like, what are you going to yes. do with that, SpaceX? Do you really need another tower? Come on. <laughs> another one. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's got some water in the ditch there. Look at that. I wonder yeah. if that's uh, leftover from Ian. They come. It is leftover from Ian. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's that. You can see the helicopter in that shot. I thought it was a drone at first, but that is the helicopter escorting yep. the cars up the road. There's the VAB up there as well. Look at that. Yep. And I see the front of the convoy. So here they come. All right. It's a surprisingly long drive, yeah. It's like they don't just suit up right next to the rocket. Uh, they suit up. It's. I mean, it's like a 15-minute drive, 10, 10 or 15-minute drive, isn't it? It is. It's about 15 to 20, uh, d yeah, d depending, but, but about 15 if you do it at the speed limit. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Our, so anyways. Right. <laughs> And they are going to be uh, passing you here shortly, aren't they, Chris? They are. You can see the beginning of the security escort uh, arriving here now. Helicopter directly overhead. And I see the armored vehicle. There they are. <laughs> the armored vehicle sort of sticks out like a sore thumb. You can see it because it's got that uh, mount on top of it, I guess. It really does, yeah. But here they come, our Crew-5 astronauts coming by the Vehicle Assembly Building and the press site on their way out to the launch pad for a liftoff at noon today. Wait about them for me. <laughs> oh, we Look, are. Here we go. Don't worry. Hey. We do it for the ticker, and we got the uh, convoy driving past the VAB. Nice. Love that shot. That's cool. That is a big building, y'all. Yeah, I don't see people in chat waving. That's no disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> people in chat waving. <laughs> they they, nice. they should wave as well. <laughs> yeah, everybody wave. You know how to like wave, right? <laughs> the emojis and things like that. Yeah. Oh Use well, maybe emoji. Nightbot. Yeah, maybe Nightbot will. Don't don't put too many because Nightbot gets angry if you put no, too no, many the, emojis. The O and the little uh, slash, <laughs> the forward slash, does a little wave. That thing. too. Yeah. You can do a salute. Okay. You can do a hand waving. Like either way is fine. <laughs> well that was that's always cool to see them coming by 
Yep. Um, and from our perspective, they're going to go behind the trees there uh, from Chris and Sawyer's perspective over there at the press site. But luckily, NASA has uh, spooled up a helicopter for us. Looks yes. Like somebody's waving there. Look, <laughs> like holding their arm up as they go <laughs> by. Nice. <laughs> And just to one side there, that's actually the crawler way they're driving next to. Oh, look at that shot. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> you can see the helicopter continuing to escort them. Can't see them for the trees there, but that is a cool shot with the water in the foreground and the helicopter peeling off in the background. So cool. At some point, it's like, what else is there to talk about while they drive? Like, <laughs> well, I'm trying to, I'm trying, I'm trying to ascertain exactly where they are on the crawler way right now. Um, it looks like they're still going by. It looks like they have. Have they gone past past the bump yet? Where the crawler way splits? Uh, I don't think so. They have not gotten to the bump yet. If I'm okay. not mistaken, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've been trying to watch. So yeah. Oh yeah, there they are. Yeah. So this is the part of the crawler way that they're going by now that splits to go to A and to B. Yep. Um, so this is where, so up until now, they've been driving by where SLS has gone by, um, up and back when it goes out to pad B, but now where they are, they're sort of out toward a viewing stand that that's owned by the visitor center here. And now they are paralleling the part of the crawler way that used to take the Saturn fives and the shuttles out to pad A, but that is no longer needed because SpaceX built the horizontal integration facility at A over the crawler way. So there is no true full crawlerway path out to 39A now. Right. There's a building in the way now. There's a building in the way, yes. Yes. <laughs> Again, y'all, coming up on three hours prior to liftoff here, the astronauts are continuing to roll out. You can oh, see look at that. that. Uh, yeah, that big starship tower in the background there. And then yeah. the smaller 39A <laughs> tower. Oh, that's a cool, like... That's a cool, like, astronaut view of... Uh, of what it's like to drive out there. That's really impressive. Yeah. I mean, cause can you imagine being one of the people in those car in the, in those cars and not just one of the people that turns around, but like one of the people that gets in the rocket, that, that would just be an incredible experience. And I mean, it's really not that bad. They, they sit in the rocket for what, two hours before launch because it's three hours before launch right now. They're going to have to get out. They're going to do their little dance outside the tower. They're going to go up the tower. They have the phone call, uh, the phone up there that they have and stuff like that. Yep. And then they get aboard the rocket. So they sit in the rocket for what, two hours? About two Roughly. hours, two, About two, two, hours. two hours, two and a half. Yeah. How yeah. does that compare with space shuttle? Uh, so for the space shuttle, they would start boarding around the same time. It was about the three hour mark in the countdown. They would pick up the count. The crew would walk out. Um, they would get out to the launch pad. There was about an hour of built in hold still in the schedule at that point. Um, but they would get in about three ish hours ahead of liftoff. Um, to the orbiters and then they had a two and then at that point they were limited in terms of maximum available launch time on the day if it wasn't a rendezvous mission to the station they were limited to two and a half hour launch window because crew time on back um became a limiting factor for how long the crew could safely be on their backs yep makes sense and there's that big spacex uh, horizontal integration facility where they uh, integrate and do the final work on the rockets before they roll up the ramp and uh, get verticated for launch. They're actually climbing that big content, concrete ramp at 39A now. And you can see most of the other cars have peeled off. We just have the uh, white Teslas climbing the pad there. There you can see the hangar door back there, a couple other pads in the backgrounds, and just the Teslas going up. Yes, indeed. I feel like this camera yeah. is aimed a little high. Like, I want to tell the camera <laughs> person to, like, like, tilt down a little bit for us have they had cameras on the cars before like this i don't remember seeing this before i yeah, don't I, remember seeing this before either we've uh, i don't know if we've seen one inside the astronaut car but uh we have seen like the chase car but i don't think we saw the chase car this time like where they're on the other side and they have the sideways shot of the astronauts like across the median i don't i didn't see a car even doing that to be yeah, fair I when they had the wide shots yeah, yeah. I, I really I, like I did it, remember. Though, I, yeah, it's the first time I've oh. seen dash cam. 
Yeah, yeah, it is like a dash cam. Yeah, that's so cool, though, because it really kind of gives you, like, the astronaut's perspective. You feel like you're you're right there doing yeah, like that. That's so yeah, cool. Like, look, <laughs> it's, like, it's like the POV, like, driving up to the tower, and there's your rocket that's going to take you to space. And that's cool. actually a really cool, uh, like, first-person perspective. Uh, and I love this tradition. So they drive them around to the back of the tower where the uh, elevators are not because it is a tradition that you get out of your vehicle that drives you to the pad and you take a moment as a crew collectively to look up at the vehicle that you will call home for the next few weeks or months um and because the strong back is um uh blocks that Core view from the north they used to do it. minus three hours crew have arrived at the pad on schedule uh, but because the transporter erector blocks that view from the south, they used to that used to be the thing they would get out of the Astro van in the shuttle era, stand on the south part of the lawn to look up at the uh, at the orbiter and the shuttle on the pad. But in order to do that for SpaceX, you have to go around to the back side of the launch pad. Um, and I really like that they have continued that tradition as well. If I if I recall correctly, that goes back as well to Alan Shepard on his first flight, looking up at his uh, yep Mercury Redstone. Yep. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I I think they're going to the back because of other matters. I I, I always remember them looking up to the to the to the rocket, but from the south side actually. Now that the, the, the you talk about that, uh, the other matters I'm thinking kind of like a bio break. Uh, I believe there are like restrooms uh, on on the back side of the tower, so. I, at least I remember they, they were talking about that on demo too, way back then. But that 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 could be the case. Yeah, we'll see if we get uh, the shot of them getting out of the vehicles and looking up at the rockets. It's it's sort of interesting because when they do it, they sort of lean back a little bit with the helmets yeah. and the SpaceX spacesuits. You can't quite lift your head up, so they have to like lean back to look up at the rocket. But I think we've gotten that in the past. Not sure if we'll get it every time. I still remember. I uh, I think it was from Action uh, One. What the the pilot made like the ninja pose. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like on either did they have like somebody on either side or something? And the pad ninjas. We continue to refer to them as pad ninjas. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's an okay name for them. Well, let's see what we get here from the astronauts. Uh, they have arrived at 39A. They did their whirlwind tour going around the uh, pad, and we'll see if we can't see what they do. While we wait for that, we've got some more questions here. Let me see if I can to grab a couple more uh, Super Chats and things like that. Me Young Cabot, thank you for becoming a Padrat member. We appreciate the support joining the membership program there. We've also got Jeremy Barkenhagen. I'm going to go with Barkenhagen on that one. Thank you for becoming a Red Team member. We appreciate you there as well. Andrew Cap pointing out the crooked NASA meatball upper stage. Uh, that was something that we were sort of looking at on the rocket. It looks like the NASA meatball may have been painted a little bit off-center. I don't know if we'll get a shot of that here later, but uh, we shall see. Let's see here. Um, we've also got... <laughs> nice, Musical Wolves. One from Musical Wolves who asks, how does the dragon get trained? <laughs> different... That's a different show, Musical Wolves. It has to watch the movie first. That's how it, it has to watch the movie, yes. It's like Robot Chicken, and they make the dragon capsule, sit there and watch the How to Train Your Dragon. I guess it would be the Pad Ninjas who have to watch the movie. Anyways, one way or the other, we appreciate the support. Thank you, Musical Wolves. We've got Al B. Opet, or Albio, Albo Pet. One of those is a Red Team member joining the membership program there. And we've got Space Pony. Space Pony has actually taken advantage of the membership gifting thing here, spreading the love to five other people. That's one of the things you can do if you're a member of the channel. You can actually gift memberships to others so that they uh, temporarily get access to all the cool behind-the-scenes perks and things like that. Space Pony, thank you so much for gifting five Red Team memberships. And I'm continuing to watch. Like, I'm watching to see if we get the astronauts out. So I am ready to stop talking at any time here. Um, but they are still getting yeah, these aerial I think, shots. Uh, our ticker is now blocking it. But but uh, there's like a wide kind of building to one mm -hmm. side of the tower. And you can see the, 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 cars. the cars there. 
Uh, I believe those are restroom um, facilities. So the, I'm actually you know. looking at all the Starship infrastructure over there. Me too, but <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I just saw that. It was like, hey, look, <laughs> it's not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever this is coming from, uh, we need to mark this down. It's like T-minus... Two hours and 55 minutes, there's this great circling shot of 39A, and you can see all the work they've been doing for the Starship launch structures back in the background there. It's off the right-hand side now, but uh, very cool. They are going for a bio-break, at least it's not the Soyuz tradition, which involves oh, yeah. leaving, leaving a bio-sample, we'll say, on the outside of the transport vehicle. <laughs> bio-sample. <Ooh>. Nice. <laughs> it goes back to Yuri Gagarin's first flight. <laughs> Uh, hey, whatever gets you into space safely, uh, I am all for different traditions and good luck charms or whatever it is. Um, what do they say? Luck has nothing to do with it, but we'll take all we can get. I think that's a good saying. <laughs> uh, let's see if we've got a couple questions here. Ah, here's a good question. So is this an RTLS launch or is this going out to a drone ship? And if so, which drone ship is supporting the launch today? Who wants that one? I can take that. I can take that it's... one. Oh, That's... yeah, it's Julie, boring. go ahead. Yeah, Julia, go. Hey, it's just read the instructions there about 574 kilometers offshore. So a little bit closer than we have for the, you know, traditional like Starlink launches. Um, just read the instructions. Is been out there since before the storm so how fun is that right so it actually went um, out and just like sort of loiters right drone yeah 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 it, it's a little bit safer than being um in port in port they would have to be station kept uh next to the dock so they they loitered out at sea and then went to the landing zone and they're hanging out ready to catch a booster right now Excellent. So that will be a drone now, ship uh, landing, right? Maybe Alex can speak to why we don't have return to landing site for crew. Alex? Um, right. Later on, I think we're going to see... Return to landing site. And real quick here, they're looking up there. They're leaning <laughs> there back. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the only way you can see That's is if awesome. you lean back awkwardly like that. Luckily, they didn't fall over. <laughs> Love the fist bump, <laughs> too. Yeah, quite a lean too. Jake. It was. I mean, you're right next to the rocket. You really got to lean back so that you can uh, see out of your spacesuit helmet there. Um, Alex, go ahead. Seven you were meters. saying RTLS. <laughs> All the way up. Uh, yeah. So the reason is because Dragon Two is quite a, a little bit heavyweight. Um, so I and, and also because they need kind of margins because it, this is a crew mission and they reserve some of the margins for for these missions. Now, cargo dragons are also based on Dragon Two, which is again it's heavy it's heavier than um than Dragon One. Uh but those don't need as much margin. The the trajectory we we've seen, you know, all of these comments about well the trajectory that's more of a concern for Atlas where the Centaur upper stage is has has less thrust and so they need two of them uh to be able to like uh, go in a in a different trajectory, whereas the Merlin vacuum engine is super powerful. It doesn't really matter uh, the trajectory in, not not that it doesn't matter. It's like the the rocket can do any different trajectories, uh, but cargo and crew have similar trajectories uh, because it, it was already doing uh, a good trajectory for crew already. I like um, I like the uh, awkward half staircase here. <laughs> like when they put no, like this is for real. Like when they yeah. put the the pad in, the way that Falcon Nine sort of matches up to the structures on the tower. Um, you ride the elevator all the way up, and then you have to take like a half flight of stairs yeah. to get to the level of the arm. That was a that's an actual thing there. We should be seeing the phone here shortly as well. Uh, they'll walk around the corner, fist bumps all around for everyone. It looks like and the pad ninja seems to have a tablet or iPad or something there. They do a lot of the checkouts and take closeout photos and stuff like that on tablets and as they go around the phone's over there isn't it are they at the phone right now yep it's on that on on the that corner right? yeah they're, they're they're using it right now the ninjas kind of configuring i guess yeah yeah and that is a holdover from the uh not a holdover but that's back from the shuttle program isn't that the same phone that they had on the structure there look at that 
Oh, gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> the black tower and the white flight suits? That's cool. And the white rocket? I mean, yep. and, and the TE? <laughs> it's, it's, lo- it's made to look good and look cool. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Who are they calling? There's a question from uh, my buddy Dr. J over here. Are they like calling from the pre- like getting a call from the president right now or something or are they calling family? Like they just had their family over there at the facility and they waved at them out the window of the car. Is like do we know who they're calling? Like can they just like order a pizza or something? I don't know. I believe it's for family <laughs> members that aren't necessarily able to make it on site cuz the ah. shuttle was always used for family. So I believe that tradition continues. Yeah. So okay, you can probably but... make a prank call before you go to space. Make a prank call. Is your dragon running? Well, you better catch it. Ha ha. And hang up and get on the rocket. <laughs> sorry. I'm not really sorry. <laughs> uh, but they don't, they're not like getting a call from the president or anything like that, right? No, or... I don't think so. Yeah, no. not, th- not that I've heard of. Okay. All right. No, I guess... it's just family. It's just that, it's just that final moment to say, I love you. Gotcha. Um, before you do something very dangerous. <laughs> it's not like a pizza delivery. Like imagine your pizza delivery address is like pad 39A, the rocket. <laughs> you get that order in your uh, delivery queue and you're like, wait, where am I supposed to go? If the pizza no, delivery uh... guy's not badged, they'll just have to leave it at the guard gate. <laughs> leave it at the guard gate. <laughs> they yeah, pick it up and it's a... in 29 hours or less or your ride is free. Or your ride is free. <clears throat> they they pick they pick it up and it's a, like a robocall. It's like we're calling to talk to you about your dragon's extended warranty. Like, <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, we've been going for two hours and almost fifteen minutes here, folks. We'll get back on the rails, but you can see it... the astronauts there uh, next to the crew arm making their phone calls, about to walk out. Why do they go up in twos? Is there a reason? I don't Probably think so. safety you could fit quite... in the elevator very comfortably. It's not a good shot. Yeah, that would yeah. make sense. I mean, I mean, I mean, the shuttle, the shuttle crews didn't all go up together. There's definitely an elevator fit thing. But if my memory's, if my memory serves, more than two got in the elevator at a time for the shuttle. Um, so I don't oh. know why it's two for for them. Yeah, yeah it might yeah, just I be mean, symmetry because I... SpaceX likes symmetry. So two and two, like two and yeah. two. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, sir. well, but then the the NASA logo. <laughs> nice, thank you. Yeah. What, what were you saying, Sawyer? Time. One person getting into the vehicle, and then the closeout crew preparing the next astronaut for entry. Ah, that makes sense. Like it's a it's a queue. They don't just all stack up there. It's like okay, one person's going, one person's going, and you only have so much room in the arm and the white room and that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Like a lot of people in seat order too. Makes sense. I guess it makes sense that you board the outside seats first and then the interior seats. Do we know the order they board in? Um, well, the fact that there are... Uh, so they do not T-minus board that... Two hours and 47 minutes. Crew have arrived at the white room just a little bit ahead of schedule. Neat. I think they actually do it reverse DOS. I think I think what we'll see here because it's it's Nicole and Josh who are who are up there right now. They're the commander and pilot. I, I believe they put commander and pilot first because the closeout crew members need to be standing where uh, Anna and Koichi will sit in order to help Nicole and Josh get into their seats. But let but let's see. Um, okay. Let, let's actually lo- watch the ordering process because I know in shuttle it was you would load the pilot you would load the commander onto the flight deck at the same time you were loading one of the mission specialists into the mid deck and you would sort of rotate back and forth who went in based on what level you were getting into in the shuttle um but but yeah let's look to see how they do it because it is a spacing consideration as alicia as as you were saying there yeah and here's one and so of the yeah. one of the traditions as well where they sign the wall of the of the entrance to the to the to the vehicle in the crew access arm. And you can see oh, there yeah. are two logos. There are the, the SpaceX logo and the NASA logo. The SpaceX logo is where astronauts for private missions uh, sign off. So like Inspiration4 and Axiom1, those sign there. Whereas the NASA logo is for NASA missions. So Like the crew mission here. Yeah, like, like this one, obviously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. They have signed uh, the logo and handed the, I guess, Sharpie back to the Pad Ninja there. 
Yes. You're not Another allowed to take tradition. a Sharpie with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another tradition that we, that we talked about uh, on the previous flights, uh, on the previous crew flights, uh, we'll see the commander, or either the commander or the pilot, take the, the patches from the ground crews, from the yeah. path ninjas. And that's sort of a tradition carried over from the shuttle. Um, it's, it's a really long-standing tradition. And that also, uh, I remember... Uh, for Crew Four, we pointed this out, and people were like, "Well, well, that's that's for NASA missions, you know, private missions. Don't do that." Well, you know what? They actually did that. Uh, yep. Jared Isaacman did that on yep. Inspiration Four, and Axiom One, uh, Michael uh, Lopez Alegria also did that too. So, yeah, it's 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 a widespread uh, kind of tradition now, yep. not just for NASA missions. Very cool. <laughs> Yep. And you can see a Nicole there on the left with the NASA patch facing the camera and Josh with the American flag on the right um, facing the camera, commander and pilot. Um, uh, you saw the ninjas sort of do their first initial like overview of them to make sure that they, they were that they, the astronauts, were configured correctly because it's not just about configuring your spacecraft correctly. You got to make sure the people are suited up correctly, too. And uh, there are some things on the suits that they remove. They want to check for FOD, for an object debris on the boots um, of the suits, of, of the pressure suits as well. Uh, because as soon as uh, Falcon 9 second stage Merlin engine cuts off uh, and you are in space, any debris or detritus that you take into that capsule goes airborne. Um, and you can see Nicole getting into Dragon right now. So our All commander for the mission countdown is At T minus two hours and 44 minutes, crew have begun ingressing Dragon. And there goes Josh. So uh, Das, exactly. Uh, there goes Josh, comma, Das. As you were saying, um, so it looks like commander, commander, pilot go first, and they reserve the mission specialist seats on either side so that the ninjas can help the commander and pilot get in first. Which makes sense because the commander and pilot have that big screen in front of them that they can't move um, yep. to a large degree, um, you know, and everything. So it makes sense that the crew helping, that the ninjas helping the crew get in would have to stand off to the side so you keep those two seats free. And then when Koichi and Anna go to get in, the ninjas can literally stand like right in front of them to help them. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, so um, Alicia, you know, when you were here for Crew Four, what was what was one of the things that sort of struck you about? Um, about about the overall process. I mean, it was kind of interesting because, again, it was so delayed. So, like, they came and they just sort of hung out, the astronauts, you know. It's like they had to keep waiting and waiting. Um, but I think one of the things that really struck me is just all these traditions that we've been going over. Um, you know, like their final meal. I heard that for these guys, they had steak and pasta. I feel like that's a very common choice. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm curious what everyone would choose as their final meal. Uh, and, you know, especially since it's first thing in the morning here. I think they ate it at like, I don't know, midnight or something like that. Um, they've been awake for quite some time for this now. Um, but, you know, their, their meal and then the playlist that they listen to as they're driving over. I wasn't able to find what they were listening to this time. I was trying to look it up. Um, and just, you know, all these, these things, signing the wall, leaning back, it's just become this amazing, just spectacle of, you know, all of these different things that they go through. It's just so fun. And they are clearly so excited too. And look at this. I love, um, Kuichi. This is his fifth flight, right? Yeah. And uh, is it fifth? One? Yeah. It's like fifth or sixth. And he's still so excited. I would be too. I mean, but yeah, I, I just, I'm so in awe for the others as their first flight they just they've got to be such a bundle of nerves and excitement and everything and the other thing that's fascinating too is um those three have actually been in the program for about 10 years now imagine applying for a job and going to the job and not actually getting to do the big thing of the job for 10 years i know i know right i mean it it, ta it takes time to get your to get your assignment right i mean yeah. it's not just a it's not just a quick little oh here we go you know um you know and and two years later you're you're flying to space but i mean to what you said you know like uh to koichi as well like he joined in 1992 um as part of the japan 
um, as part of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Group. And uh, he actually was quite fortunate. It was four years before he flew for the first time in 1996. But yeah, he flew on, he launched on three shuttles and landed on three shuttles. Um, two missions was a launch and landing. One was a launch, and then he had to wait for another shuttle to come get him from the ISS in in 2009 and then he did a soyuz long duration mission to the station and now this one so overall in terms of launching this will be his fifth flight to space wow. of three on and the it, shuttle and one on soyuz and now one on dragon yeah i was gonna say this is his third vehicle that he's ridden in too so kind of an interesting thing for him to be able to compare all these three and really see the technology just as it's it, grown it really is, too. But one of the interesting things about the Japanese astronauts in particular, because Koichi, Soichi, and um, uh, Aki, So as much as we keep saying, oh, you know, they join a rare list of people for, for the Japanese astronauts, this is actually the norm flying on three completely different spacecraft in the shuttle Soyuz and now Dragon um, for so many of them. Um, I'm actually struggling to think of if there's anyone other than Aki, Soichi and Koichi uh, who are currently in the Japanese program um, for that. But it, it, really, it really fascinating how this is all sort of, um, you know played out. And, and on the flip side of that, you have all the European crews who have launched on Soyuz's and now Dragons, but they all, the current crop of uh, uh, ESA astronauts largely missed the shuttle program um, because of everything. So it really is interesting how this has all sort of moved around and changed over the years. And of course, uh, keeping with what we've got now, you can see uh, Anna and uh, Koichi inside of the white room there at the end of the crew access arm uh waiting their turn to board the endurance here today um but yeah and um yeah yeah but but alicia there for you yeah and there they go uh so here we go so all of our crew uh uh, so we got three of the four are now in. Um, that was Koichi that went in third. And now Anna is getting ready to enter as well. So Anna will be the final crew member into Endurance today ahead of liftoff here at targeting a liftoff at noon uh, here from the Kennedy Space Center, 1600 UTC. And if I recall correctly, the Dragon spacecraft seats actually move into a position for them to ingress and then transition before launch into a launch position as well. That is yep. correct. That's one of the cool things that we will see here. Alex, do you want to talk? Yeah, so basically what they have is the initial Dragon uh, d that. display. Um, yeah, the, the, the initial, the initial uh, set, uh, setup of this was that the crew displays will come down instead of the seats going up and now actually to to favor the 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 comfort of the ingress into the vehicle they they have that seat rotation kind of uh, procedure where instead of the displays moving it's the seats themselves that move and and they also accommodate so one of the reasons also that's why it's in place it's that because because of that they can also adjust the position of the of the seats for re-entry and also for splashdown, so that's another another comfort kind of kind of thing where you can adjust the the load onto the astronaut as as they go through different parts of the of the flight. And you know, eventually that will be interesting to see uh, how they do that for for Starship because you know with a belly flop, that's a lot of loads in different directions that you're gonna see. <laughs> so yeah. Putting their gloves on. I always found it interesting, actually, if you've ever had a chance to see these suits up close, it is just stunning that these are actually airtight. I, you know, you see zippers, you see this fabric, it looks so thin, and yet, you know, they're, they're literally just, like, zipping. How is this possible? Yeah, that's, that's actually... Um... Uh, that's actually something that Boeing also has on their, on their suit, the... They they have like sips and things like that. I'm I'm really interested in in like getting to know how it all works because to me I see a zipper and it's like that has to leak. Like th there must be somewhere else it has to leak or something. It 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 cannot be airtight or something. It just 
it's just a little bit deceiving, I guess. Uh, but but yeah, it it kind of looks like that. And and it's a you know it's a cool uh, suit in that sense because it kind of tricks you into thinking that you know it's all it's all tied that you don't see any of the uh, for example like the Boeing one you can see the zippers on that one but here you can only see it if they like they have covers and things like that just especially made to be able to cover them just for for aesthetics just just to look good which is really cool. Yeah, it looks like somebody's struggling with their glove there. Is that Josh, I think? In the center. Oh, yeah, right. final, final adjustments and, and things like that. I, I, Interesting, because it's, it it's takes, that one piece, right? <laughs> yeah. I guess it, it takes a little bit of time to, to adjust to find the, the right position. This is interesting because uh, t to me, it kind of, sh I mean, it in some sense, it kind of shocked me the first time that I learned th this, but also kind of not, that this is actually, I think, the second or third time they put on their suit, their own suit. When they train, they use previous suits from other, from other astronauts that flew before. Uh, and they may not be entirely, you know, fitted to their bodies. They they try to get them like the closest match, but it is not always the 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 the, the perfect one. Whereas these ones, the ones that they actually wear during launch, they are made for their bodies. And I think they put this on during the dry dress rehearsal. And I think this is actually the, the only second time they wear these. Uh, so it's I mean it, it's kind of understandable that they are now like trying to fit everything together and struggling a little bit trying to find their position and, and like the, their comfort for for those things. So yeah, I'm, I'm not really surprised in that sense, I guess. Well, yeah, they're going to be riding in this thing for, what, 26 hours, I think they said? It's one of the longest dockings now. Mm. Yeah, 29, 29 hours from launch 29 to docking hours. for this one, yeah. Fortunately, they don't wear the, the suit all the time, but yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And that's a good and that's a good point because after they get into after they get into orbit and they know Jet Dragon is stable and you know they've conf they've triple confirmed that there are no leaks uh the crew's allowed to get out of their suits um and then you know have a bit more freedom in that regard and then uh they put them back on for the docking procedure. Um just as a precaution um and then i believe they wear them to Alex during um undocking operations and then obviously for mm. Reentry and and splashdown. And I know we have uh, just because we 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 talked about the twenty nine hours. I know we always have like the the usual question: Why don't they do you know three hours or six hours like 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 Soyuz, right? Uh, well, there's there's a couple of reasons. The first one is in order to be able to do those fast rendezvous to the International Space Station, you cannot do those every single day. Uh, there's just because of, of how the orbit of the ISS and where in the orbit is located. So uh, it's it's all about orbital mechanics, uh, obviously. Long story. Uh, and, and, and so when you're in Florida, the weather does not always cooperate. We have good weather right now uh, for, for the rest of the week, thankfully, after Hurricane Ian. Um, but it's not always the case. And Soyuz, on the other hand, it's kind of more like weatherproof. <laughs> it can basically uh, <laughs> launch in many different weather conditions. Let's put it that way. Uh, so, so you got to take into account the, the fact that if you have to commit to a certain date, and the the moment you move to a, to like the next day, that reverts you to a two day rendezvous for Soyuz. So if Soyuz were to scrub. And and it sometimes happens. Uh, by the way, it's rare, but it sometimes happens. And it actually happened a few times for not Soyuz themselves, but for Progress. And it has been that you know they launch, they, they were trying to launch a Progress in a six-hour or three-hour rendezvous. They scrubbed for whatever reason, and then the next day they went and they went with a two uh, a two-day uh, rendezvous because it was already off. Like they couldn't do it already right so if you have any scrubs you just basically cannot do the fast rendezvous so you go with what orbital mechanics uh dictates 
And then apart from that, you also have to consider the crew health. So you cannot do like 10 hour or 12 hour rendezvous, for example, are sort of like the limit that they try to impose because that will mean those 10 to 12 hours plus the eight hours prior to the launch plus, you know, the launch time, the, the crew will be awake for a long, long time. And so you don't want those. And the shortest, I th so the, 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 there's a gap, like they could do eight hours, for example, and they have had attempts to eight hour rendezvous. But after that, it's more like 20, 21 or 22 hours just to fit in between a sleep period for the crew to sleep in orbit. Because otherwise they will be uh, basically awake for a long, long time, like way more than 15 or 16 hours, which is not good for, for the crew, obviously. But yeah. And I guess a third, and probably not that much important, but it's still important in high Jared, <laughs> by the way, which right. seems like, <laughs> yeah, from, from NASA feed. Um, another, another uh, reason is also because of the um, the size of like the space, the interior space of of Crew Dragon is way more than a Soyuz. Uh, so you can you can kind of uh, afford the the waiting on on Crew Dragon. Whereas Soyuz, you kind of want to get there to the ISS <laughs> uh, a little bit faster. Bigger. Gosh, the Soyuz is three people. This thing can hold up to seven. Yeah, well, I, I guess if you fit it, uh, like if you try to fit seven into this, it would the, be tight. But yeah, that's it would be apparently really the crew tight. capacity for the Dragon <laughs> capsule. I'm thinking maybe on, on, on the NASA feed they're talking about Polaris and like Jared and and all that stuff. That's why they're showing those those shots. <laughs> See, but but we talk yeah. about them not just. You know, not just during launch coverage and things like that. Uh, but we also covered in our recent NSF Live. Haha. -ha. <laughs> so you can Indeed watch that did. after the launch. Indeed we did. And what's what's cool about this is now that they're they're in the capsule, right? So we're gonna hear some communication checks that, that are gonna be coming up with them. We're gonna see the ninjas. Uh, start to grease and then get ready to seal, close and seal the hatch and do the initial leak checks and, and everything, making sure that Dragon is good to go. And this is actually one of the reasons they load the crew uh, sort of as early as they do, uh, because we've seen a couple of times in in some Dragon countdowns um, uh, that... The, the the closing of that hatch and the sealing of it doesn't always go right the first time. Sometimes you can get little bumps Copy in the seal. Dragon, sometimes stand the by for umbilical comm check. There we go. See right on cue. Uh, but they load the crew that early so that if they need to redo anything or they run into any issues here, they've got some time to work it. And they've actually had the hatch completely closed and had to reopen it before and still made the launch window. So that's why they part of why they put the crew in so early as this. But standing by for those uh, umbilical checks that we're going to hear, um, hopefully very soon from Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna. Now this is a time where they do like a gazillion com checks. GDR, PLT, MS1, MS2, com check. Has you loud and clear. MS1, uh, has you loud and clear. MS2, has you loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Umbilical com check is complete. Stand by for ground station com check. And those comm checks have begun. We're going to. See, and so that's that's what yeah. I was talking about before. That they do a gazillion comm checks because they have like multiple ways of communicating with a with the vehicle. So they have to check all those lines between the vehicle and and like mission control. Mm -hmm. And then also with launch control, they they communicate with those as well. It's it's crazy. There's there's many comm checks right now, but that's good. <laughs> they have to do those. Yes, indeed. You want to make sure you've got all those done uh, prior to, uh, uh, and that they're good prior to continuing down to some of the other critical ops that we have coming here. Um, 
as they continue to uh, get the crew. Um, the crew is loaded now, and they are fully strapped in and connected to all of Dragon systems. Those are those umbilical comm checks that you just heard. Um, so switching over now to make sure that the ground stations can talk to them, um, and then they'll have a satellite uh, comm check as well uh, here coming up. Uh, and, and things are progressing. As, as you can see, the ninjas are sort of waiting outside of the hatch here for the uh, comm checks to complete. We are two hours, 25 minutes away from the scheduled liftoff of Dragon and the Crew-5 mission here to the International Space Station. Um, and definitely some, uh, definitely seven people on board the space station taking an interest uh, in, again in what is happening here at Kennedy as their new, um, as their housemates and house guests uh, and soon to be permanent residents of the station are set to begin their commute to the orbiting laboratory here, uh, here today. But uh, for those of you who are just joining us, everything has been going very well um, so far with the countdown and getting the crew on board for um, our launch today. Uh, there are no technical issues that um, they have talked about that are being worked. Weather uh, for launch is forecast and predicted to be go a 90% chance of acceptable weather conditions here at Kennedy. All of the abort weather for the landing zones in the Atlantic Ocean up the east coast of the United States and across the North Atlantic to Ireland are good. And there are no weather constraints for abort uh, criteria today. Um, and just another brief rundown. Here for those of you who are just joining us, um, Nicole Mann from NASA is the commander of Crew Five and Dragon Endurance. She is the first woman to command a U.S. launch and entry mission since Pamela Melroy in October of 2007 on Discovery and STS-120. Joining her, she is a first-time flyer. Joining her Dragon, is Joss SpaceX. Com check. Check Dragon, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Ground station comm check is complete. Stand by for Tedris comm check. All right, and Tedris is the tracking and data relay satellite network. So those are the uh, communication satellites from NASA in geostationary orbit. So that's another big one because that's primarily how they will communicate once they are in space. Um, but as, uh, as we're joining Nicole is uh, Josh Cassida. He is the pilot also from NASA. NASA and also a first time flyer. Both Nicole and Josh were originally scheduled to fly the crew test flight of Starliner, uh, but were moved to Crew Dragon due to the delays with the Starliner program. Uh, also joining Dragon, them as basic, a first time complex. flyer is oh. Anna Kikina uh, from Russia and Ross Cosmo. She's the first loud and Russian clear. cosmonaut. To fly Four, on a U.S. Loud and vehicle, clear. Um, comm check is complete. No Stand by for comm check with DC, MD, and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon DC on countdown one. Comm check. DC Dragon, loud and clear. DC, loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with MD. Dragon, MD on countdown one, comm check. MD, Dragon, loud and clear. MD, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check over Dragon the ground. Dragon, MD, Dragon the ground, comm check. MD, Dragon, loud and clear. MD, loud and clear, stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon, LD on countdown one, comm check. LD, Dragon, loud and clear. LD, loud and clear, stand by for comm check over Dragon the ground. Dragon, LD on Dragon to Ground, comm check. LD, Dragon, loud and clear. And LD, loud and clear. Let's go have some fun. Dragon, SpaceX, 
Launch configuration comm checks are complete. Report when ready for seat rotation per section 2 of 4.100. Okay, so that was the Space the comp checks. We are ready for section two and ready for seat rotation. Copy that, Dragon. We will report when initiating. <laughs> okay, it seems like now they have stopped. Um, those those were the comp checks with a with a launch director, uh, launch control teams at. Kennedy Space Center, they have Hawthorne for Mission Control, but also Launch Control Center at the Kennedy Space Center. And we're going to see soon the, the seed rotation that we were talking about uh, earlier. And, and that's really cool as well. Um, really hoping we, we get to see that. I, I don't think. In addition, by the way, the launch is also being tracked in Houston as well, as they'll be yep. taking. They'll be working with them as they enter the sphere, the imaginary sphere, so to speak, around the ISS that is the International Space Station sort of front yard and backyard. Yeah, using the big loop, <laughs> the the kind of uh, common communications loop that that they use for for these operations at the ISS. There's a lot exactly. of things that they have to coordinate in terms of, of communications. It's always crazy to me that you know that. The the things that they have to manage between all the different you know uh, feeds and everything it's it's amazing and and they, it, like this is the eighth time and this is not even the the, the you know the, the first handful of, of flights this is like almost getting there to double digits already so so that's amazing yeah, that's and every launch they continue to refine it even more and more and to get back in. I know I sound probably like the Chris's, but back in the shuttle days, I mean, here at Kennedy <laughs> Space Center, there was, a, there was a huge giant antenna called Mila, which was the Merritt Island launch annex that basically helped with communications and tracking. And now that's gone, and there's places like Dragon. Starbase that have tracking satellites now and all across the globe, and it's such a more refined network. Dragon. Plus Tedris helps. I believe there were... Couple of comms there. Oh, seat rotation oh. is underway. There you there go. go. <laughs> How long until they install a ride like this at Disney? <laughs> They've got that mission space ride, actually. It's pretty cool. It's a giant centrifuge. And if you also notice now, you can see them starting to work on the screens as well. The screens are positioned specifically so that the way their seats are right now, they can reach them and check the status of the vehicle and the countdown. Dragon SpaceX, seats are in the launch position. Dragon So this capsule, Endurance, um, this was the one that Crew-3 um, flew on, and it's actually had a bit of refurbishment since then. Um, they had, um, I think they, they have a new heat shield that they put on it. Yeah. A uh, other upgrades. I, I um, think. Parachutes, um, some nose cones, some, some other things like that. Yeah, and, and this actually is one of the first... Uh, the the first crew capsule that they're reusing the one of the well all all four of the forward Draco thrusters. So normally it seems like they kind of like re, uh, replace those between flights, probably for further refurbishment or inspections. Uh, but for this one, they're they're reusing the the forward bulkhead um, Dracos. I'm not sure if if it's from the previous mission or from another capsule. Uh, I'm not sure if they have they have talked about that uh, specifically, but yeah, and and for Crew Four, I think it was the the back shell of the of the heat shield was also reused on that mission as well. So that's interesting that you know they they're, they're kind of getting there where more and more parts of Dragon don't need to be completely replaced, 
or or like um getting heavy refurbishment or things like that so yeah uh, i mean we'll see we'll see um what what eventually <laughs> happens uh i'm kind of thinking maybe by the end of the program it all looks like you know the the boosters all sooty <laughs> Uh, we'll see yeah. dragons just not being clean at all or something. I don't know. And that's the twist of irony here is I, that I, while it's a previously flown booster, this is, or a previously flown capsule, this is a rare sight of a clean first time flying booster. Mm. Yep. <laughs> you know, and, and I like that idea of the aesthetic, Alex, as far as, as dragons being reused. But when we see them come back to port um, as a very, very toasty marshmallow, <laughs> that ablative shield has done its job, and I have a feeling you will always see a new ablative shield installed. Oh, At yeah, least me, imagine. if I were an astronaut, I I would want a brand new heat shield every time. Thank you very much. I, I want sure. a clean marshmallow when I go to space. <laughs> and that's it. and you know the the name of that white uh, shield that they have around the capsule, the white panels. What's Those are that? spam. That's a SpaceX proprietary ablative material, SPAM. So <laughs> SPAM. <laughs> the acronym is Dragon, really, really funny. You are go for Section 3 suit leak check preparation. Space Dragon is a go for suit leak check preparation, Section 3, 4.100. Good readback. Well, let this, the leak checks begin. Yeah, closing their visors and oh, they're they're going to get pressurized like a balloon. I, I hope we we kind of see that. Maybe Chris B can can do like uh, uh, a a a time lapse of of them just inflating like balloons <laughs> <laughs> with bandicam. <laughs> and those bandicam. Most of those suits are actually pressurized. Like we were talking about how thin they are. They get really, really rigid. In fact, those gloves, it takes a bunch of effort even to sometimes just bend your fingers in them. That they keep kind of fit, well, Josh in particular keeps kind of fidgeting with those gloves and Anna too. So I feel like maybe that's what's happening here. They're just trying to get the right fit there. Because each of these spacesuits is essentially its own spacecraft. It's designed that mm -hmm. if there was a depressurization or something with the dragon, that they could still survive and have oxygen in their own atmosphere, basically. And it's similar to what they use for spacewalks, just a little less complicated. So did I miss much? I had to step away for a second there, y'all. And it looks like we've got uh, four astronauts in their capsule, huh? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. They they are getting pressurized right now, so they're trying to get comfortable in their little space. Space suit. Dragon, we have space crap. pair complete and complete the section three. I didn't quite catch what the uh, beginning of that was. Did anybody translate what they just said? Something, something, One of the sections section was three? complete. Yeah, something was complete. Copy yeah. that, Dragon. You are go for section four suit leak check. Suit leak check. Okay. I so that's that where the pressurization. For suit meet check yeah. Section four. So that's where they actually close up the suits and they make sure that the suits themselves are airtight, right? Exactly. Yeah. Not to make a pun, but I guess this is the highest pressure part of the flight. I guess. Wow. Well, well. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Everybody groan. <laughs> So we are coming up on uh, two hours here, two hours and 11 minutes, and the astronauts being strapped in and stuff like that are in. I mean, I saw, like, right when I came back, I saw the pistons, like, raise the seats up into the launch position. So they're, like, laying down. And they were going to get some behind-the-scenes statistics here. Oh, these are, like, the uh, missions. We know all of this. We, we, we have Chris. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we talked about that there for a minute. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. know all of this. We don't Frequent need to flyer see that. card. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see, I'm kind of thinking of because the other day, well, the other day, a couple of weeks ago, uh, for the SLS stream that we did, Jack was like, "Moon, moon, moon," and I'm trying to think of something for today, 
But I cannot think like ISS. ISS. It doesn't really feel the same. It's like the crew, crew, crew. It's the motto here. Like dragon, dragon, dragon. Up. Yeah, dragon, dragon, crew, dragon. Say it five times. Oh yeah, if, uh... if you say crew, it's five times. Yep. Crew, 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 and crew, crew. <laughs> five times. <laughs> if I had to guess, if Jack was here, he would just call it is. <laughs> oh no! Don't don't say that. He'll show up and start uh... pronouncing things. God. Yeah, so we're right next to the yeah. V A B here. T pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not E's, it's ISS, yeah. Alright, so seems like they're undergoing the the suit leak checks there, they are inflated. You can see them. Yeah, I was about so to say like, if you look moving. at the uh yeah, if you look at the astronauts, the suits kind of puff up a little bit. Uh, that's expected, but uh, m most spacesuits do that, and it looks a little funny and can limit your movement a bit. In fact, when you design spacesuits and when you design systems for spacesuits, it's important to take into account the fact that their motion will be limited by a pressurized spacesuit. Yeah. <laughs> Adrian said on, on the back channels, Leo, 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 okay. Leo, Leo, Leo. There you go. <laughs> also interesting is the gloves that they do have on on that spacesuit. Besides, you know, being practical, they also have the uh, on the fingers uh, addition so that they can use all their touch screens. As most of the things in there are touch screens or iPads within the Dragon. Yep, they do have physical buttons, so I, I've seen many people like, oh, touch, you know, touch screens are not really good for emergency situations. It's like, well, that's why they have buttons for emergency situations. They even have if a handle recall, for the abort system to be manually activated. If I recall correctly, it's somewhere in the range of a little over 20 switches. That's it. Yep. Close to the shuttle, which had dozens of panels full of switches. Does it, does it, we show four good new chips. Four good leak checks, I think that, that was, dragon. right? We saw the same standby while we just confirmed those results long-term and then for uh, next actions. Dragon copy and standby. So that is good. Uh, the next step there, the four good leak checks are part of the process they need to do. The door is still open, so they still have to close the door and they need to check the entire capsule. But the actual individual astronaut suits are now all set to go. So let's see here. It's been a little bit since we've answered some uh, super chats and stuff here. So let me grab a couple of these real quick. We've got uh, Musical Wolves. We answered that one from 89 minutes ago. Can Falcon 9 do an RTLS when launching Dragon? We did answer that, Musical Wolves. Uh, Dragon's a little bit heavier, so it does not do the RTLS. So mm -hmm. we did catch that one, not behind there. Uh, we've got, let's see here. Attila Marigi asks, do you think SpaceX will switch to the 3-6 hour ISS transfers, or do they have a reason for keeping it a day-long procedure? Suit leak checks. Go ahead, SpaceX. Okay. All right, Josh. We saw you come in a little bit lower than you did on dry dress. So just as a measure of precaution, we're going to have the closeout lead come in and just take a quick look and double check that everything is looking secure for zippers and umbilicals. How copy? That's his hand. We copy, and <laughs> we were thinking the same. Thanks a lot. Good read. There's a lot of fidgeting with that glove. Yeah. So we'll see what they do there. Um, do they need to reseal something or reseat something or something like that? We're going to try and get some of the questions here, but when they do break in from Mission Control, we're going to uh, stop with the questions and listen to what they have to say because that is the critical part yep. that they're going through right now, getting these astronauts all ready to go for their ride to the ISS. So the question there was from Attila, why does SpaceX not do the three to six hour ISS transfers like the Soyuz? Like, is that something... A limitation of the dragon is that just the way it works is it like a space traffic thing do we know what the answer to that one is yeah i, I actually explained it before uh a okay. little bit longer i'm gonna do a summary basically orbital mechanics doesn't allow you to always do that uh 
scrub, you know, scrub constraints and things like that. Uh, Florida weather is not nice, whereas Soyuz kind of has a little bit more of a weatherproof kind of profile. And and I think that was it. Well, apart from you know the benefit of you know Crew Dragon is larger, so you can take a little bit longer. Whereas Soyuz, it's more cramped, and you know you, you, you want to get there kind of quick to the ISS. Yep. So that's gotcha. sort of the, the summary of the explanation that I did before. There's also more There's room dragon. in the Dragon. Oh, yeah. Go this ahead, will be Dragon's longest rendezvous, by the way, at 29 hours from liftoff to docking. Gotcha. Yep. I was going to say you have more room in the Dragon as well. Like, when you're in the Soyuz, you're, like, in the clown car of space capsules. Um, you're super stuffed in there, and then you have the little orbital module that you can stretch out some, but there's not a whole lot of room to move around inside of these Soyuz. Um, whereas the dragon, you got room to sort of float around in there. So you have the luxury of a little bit more space to be comfortable. And here you can see it looks like they do have a ninja back in there working on that suit. Yeah. And we'll see if there's anything specific that they're working on. He's looking like it. Is that an indicator or? That's the umbilical. They they'd be, yeah, they'd be looking at the umbilicals and all the zippers for a double check. Yep, yep. That almost looks like well, a razor. That is interesting because they said they passed all of the suit leak checks. I'm surprised they'd be messing with that right now. Yeah, yeah they cause... said later that that they they were looking at some kind of ify data on the, the the pressure checks on on Josh's suit. So yeah, they were like, like you know, when they did the dry dress rehearsal where they yeah. go through the entire launch countdown just without the rocket fueled. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 one of the things they try to get there. And and check on all the zippers, all all the connections, and make sure that everything. Dragon, dragon ground from C three. How do you hear? C three, I've got you five by five. How me? Hey. <laughs> got you nice. the same. Thank you. <laughs> Good thing they were a little ahead of schedule. If they're uh, playing around with their boots now. Yeah, I think I actually... just... Go ahead, sorry. I was going to say, the umbilical that they have on there isn't just for the oxygen and things where their suit is locked. That also has their connection to the comms as well. So that's why they're double-checking, I believe, the comms with suit three as they recheck the umbilical. Yeah. We just take a moment to imagine what Josh is feeling right now. Like, it's his first flight. He's having some issues with his suit. Like, <laughs> he's got to be freaking out a little bit, I'm sure. You don't want to be that guy, like the astronaut right? <laughs> whose suit has the problem. Oh, gosh. Like, what did I do? Like, I didn't zip up my boot correctly. Or, I mean, I guess it's it's not even like you put it on incorrectly. Like, there are people to help you get everything right, done yeah. correctly. It, it's honestly, they, they, they almost certainly didn't do anything. Yeah. It's just the way that well, uh, your suit down rolled wrong, today. Like, you can't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, there are people whose jobs it is to literally dress astronauts. Which yep. I, I, that's, I want that job now, just saying. What do you think they do the rest of the time? Like, They have like astronaut dummies that they dress to practice dressing the actual astronauts, or they like modify the suits or something like that. They're like spit polishing the boots or something. <laughs> something along Dude, those lines. To, to answer the question more seriously, there are probably people that also work on either designing or you know, um, actually putting together spacesuits and maybe work on other dragon operations and stuff like that. But I do like to think they spend a lot of time polishing boots. Polishing the, the suits, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there is an entire materials division at SpaceX in Hawthorne that works solely on designing, manufacturing the suits and everything for specific astronauts. Yep. Makes sense. Let's grab a couple more Super Chats here real quick. Uh, this one is from Smooth Juice. Nice, with some curly L's. <laughs> hey, guys and geeks, it's a beautiful day for a launch. Don't forget to smash the likes. Thank you there, Smooth Juice, for reminding people to click the thumbs up like button. In an answer to my name, I hate bitter juice. You like Smooth Juice? And Dragon Space. And you hate bitter juice. We got a report from the closeout lead about verifying all the zippers and umbilicals. We're just chatting with a few more folks to see if there's any other actions we want to take at this time. We do have 15 minutes remaining in the margin here, so plenty of time. Okay, and the update from the net there. 
that they're continuing to, uh, they went through, they checked the zippers and stuff like that. I guess they're talking with some other people. They're probably doing the uh, pressure checks again. They're seeing if the pressure holds stable because a lot of times that's what they do, right? They just, they pressurize the suit and then they watch the pressure to see if it's slowly going down or something like that. Well, with the visor up, I don't think they're checking the pressure right now. (laughs) Oh yeah, you're right. The visors are up. Thank you. I believe what happened earlier is they started the, they said that there was good pressure, and then they were waiting to see if the pressure continued to hold for the "quote unquote" long-term pressure. So yeah, I believe that that's what they may be doing again as well. Yeah. Anyways, we will continue to listen in for their uh, updates as to what's going on inside the capsule. Let's see. Here's another question from Ann Creary: What is the black thing the Pad Ninja is putting inside the helmet by their mouth? We seen like a microphone or something in there. Does anybody see the black thing inside the helmet? It looks like an mm. Oreo cookie or maybe a Hydrox. Oh, an Oreo cookie. And Jack's on stream. How's it going, Jack? Hi, Jack. Hi. How are you doing? It's a crew launch day, so I'm doing great. Excellent. Y'all, we've got uh, Mr. Jack Bayer here who is hanging out with us. We'll be doing some commentary. Thanks for joining us, Jack. Yeah, no worries. So again, we're sort of uh, listening in for the call-outs because we get a little bit more audio chatter during this portion. How you doing, Jack? You got some uh, questions up here you want to run us through, or what do you want to do? Yeah, sure enough. I can uh, run through some questions while we wait for the result of this next... I guess, I guess, is it safe to call it a leak check? Can I call it that? So, I think we could call it that. Uh... Dragon SpaceX for suit leak checks. There you go. There you go. <gasps> go ahead, Mike. All right, Josh, that completes the troubleshooting actions we wanted to take. So we verified that your umbilical has been reseated and your zippers are closed. Given that, we are recommending that we are... that we that you proceed back to section three of 4.100 and reperform the suit leak check preparation and suit leak checks. I'll copy. Okay, Dragon copies. We're gonna step into section three of 4.100 and we'll let you know when we're ready to reperform the suit leak checks. Good read back. Alrighty, so going back to a step and reperforming a leak check. And they're all doing it, too. You can see they're putting their visors down. Um, all right, let's do some questions while they do their leak check. Obviously, we'll be vigilant to not talk over any SpaceX comms. I feel like I have PTSD with all these leak checks. I oh, yeah, uh, I was kind of thinking uh, the same thing. I'm glad somebody yeah. said it. Well, yeah. I mean, also one of the other things that they mentioned uh, during one of the the pre-launch briefings was that they had a leak um, in their fire suppression system on board this capsule. Um, they had a leaking connection, of course, um, for basically like their fire extinguisher. Um, so they, they replaced it, obviously. They have a new fitting and a new O-ring, and they refilled the bottle and, you know, test and make sure everything was all good. Dragon. Uh, is complete in step 3.9. We are ready for the checks. But yeah, just hearing leaks. Copy uh, that, Dragon. God. You are go for section four suit leak check. It's like the Rocket Lab mission I never want to hold again. I never want to leak again. The good news is they're not trying to pressurize any of these suits with uh, hydrogen. <laughs> Yesterday's Atlas was proof. Hydrogen can go without leaking. It is. <laughs> That's amazing. The, da- the Daily Hopper said, uh, what was it? It's like, what? Rockets aren't supposed to leak. Like SLS in the background of the Daily Hopper comic. Mm. That SLS <laughs> was so Cheers. sad. It was so sad looking. It was. Oh, man. Uh, well, pertinent to what we're watching right now with the leak checks, Brian V is asking, do they have spare suits for each person if one fails to seal? On board? That's a good question. I don't think on board, but maybe like in the in the ready I room? Don't, or... That's not I don't gonna think help, they though. do at all. Because the problem is the suits are all pretty tailor-made to each astronaut. And so I'm, I'm not even sure they have spares. I mean, 
maybe at Hawthorne they built more than one and but once they had a set that worked, I don't think they have they definitely don't have extras on board Dragon. I highly doubt they even have extras here in Florida unless maybe they have some spare parts here and there. Yeah. I wonder if seem... it's Go ahead. Go check. I was just thinking, I wonder if it's like the the uh EVA suits on the ISS where they have not necessarily um like a spare but they might have like multiple sizes of a top or multiple sizes of a bottom yeah like, i don't know if they're able to swap out like oh we'll get you a different pair of pants or something yeah i, don't so. So yeah, I for think those the, aspects uh... of it since they are custom tailored but maybe like a fitting or something like that they could replace yeah that makes sense exactly yeah if they had to replace something right here, I think it'd be too late. Like they said, they had 15 minutes left in the margin. Well, certainly you're not going to get out of the capsule, go all the way down the elevator, get back in the Teslas, drive all the way back out, change your pants, come back out again. Like that's not something they could do the same day. But if they were having a problem with a suit back when they were suiting up, they could likely uh, maybe swap something out there. But I don't think you could like do an entire pants change after you get to this point. But what happens if you're on here and, I don't know, you get a snag or something? I, don't, I mean, obviously, they try not to put things that would cause snags in there. But, I don't know, stuff happens. You know, what ha happens if there's um, a, a leak? What do you do? It sounds like you don't go to space that day. Yeah, um, space. But, but what if you're already in space? Like, what if it's in these 29 hours? That's a very good question. And you do a somersault by accident and you rip your pants. Like, you know what? Do? Flex seal. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm it is sorry. worth noting that the, the in-dragon suits are kind of a backup thing. In theory, mm -hmm. the capsules should always just be pressurized enough right. that they're fine. Um, they're, that's why they have them only on during like launch and then docking. Um, that's true. Because that's true. They're, they're for contingency use. So, in theory, the suits are the backup option. Um, but yeah, it's also <laughs> worth mentioning that this is not the first time that the suits are being pressurized. And I think it might also be a good question there. Like you were saying, Doss, like you can't do a pants change at this point. It's a little late for that, which I love that that's what you went with because that's an amazing image. I, I love it. Similar numbers. <laughs> similar numbers. Yeah, that sounded like but four what good I was saying is, there. Go, Chris. And yeah. copy that, but Dragon. What I, what we I was saw the same with they... four suits all passing their leak checks, even though seat three yeah. is still in the same family. That is good verification of the integrity. So at this time, we are going to proceed with the count uh, and move into Section 5 uh, for side hatch closure and delay any other troubleshooting steps until we get on orbit. How copy? Okay, that's great news. Dragon copy, and we are going to continue into Section 3 of 4.100. Sorry, Section 5 of 4.100. Good correction. We copy. All right. All right. Well, this sounds good. Um, but I wonder, I wonder how much, like, if they bring, s like, small little spares out to the pad with them. So, like, it's only a matter of running down to a Tesla to get a new glove or, you know, to get a new, you know, piece. Of, like, one of those little things we were talking about that you could easily swap out. I wonder if they bring some spares with them. Yeah, I'm, I'm super curious about this now. Like, I mean, and I imagine there's different helmet sizes, but I don't know how, quite how much you can tailor, a, like, say, a helmet to an individual person beyond it being like a medium or a large or a small. Um, I do wonder if they have spares. But um, talking about the suits and how they're sort of tailored for each astronaut individually, Adrian is asking in a similar vein, do they customize the seats? For each individual astronaut? The answer I is don't. yes. Oh. Yes, each of them, I believe, has uh, a custom mold that is fitted to the top of their dragon seat uh, and connects directly into their spacesuit through that. But I believe, if I recall correctly, that they are custom molded to each of the astronauts. And in fact, each of the part names on the seat, as well as the spacesuit itself, Instead of a serial number, it uses their names as part of the official part number to remind the workers that you are working with people here, not just parts. Wow, that's amazing. Nice touch. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know they do that for Soyuz, for sure, but that's cool. Yeah. For dragon. Here we go. Are we going to uh, close the hatch here next? Is that what's up next? That should be up next, yep. Correct. Excellent. So we will watch for take, uh... the hatch closure here. More um, leak checks. 
thinking about that the whole seat situation though like it's a I just want to imagine that they're like the most comfortable seat ever. Like if it's a seat made specially for you to go to space in, is there any more comfortable seat in, like on the planet? I wager perhaps not. And also to absorb, you know, three G's on launch and reentry as well. Oh is man. Is it uh, true also? I think that don't they make them just slightly larger because they're you grow a little bit when you're in space and when you come back? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Spiny long gates. Final steps Here's in a question. For side hatch closure. Stand by for transition to pad hatch closed. Ensure that all items are secure from now through launch. There goes the little safety seal thing. They they used to prevent FOD getting in the. Uh... Copies. All item, items are secure, and we're standing by for pad hatch closed. Good words. Good words. Uh, they're hearing is that basically trash. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think they're hearing it... that like serious, like that noise, or is that just an artifact of the way we're getting it? I bet they hear yeah. it. That would like the, give me a headache. You talking the beep? Which, by the way, NASA calls them quindar tones. In case you're all wondering. No, the like every time they yeah. talk, there's a there's a noise in the background that's like like while they're unless talking. That's, unless it's from the fans inside Dragon, possibly. Yeah, it's, it sounds like a loose audio connection or something like that, but uh, I anyways. believe it's been present through all past crew launches. Well, I think we're going to tap out Alex really quick here and tap in Adrian. Alex, thank you for being on the beginning of the stream before me. Even. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, you know, it's it's always a pleasure to join this these commentary streams, but you know, these, these are a little bit long, so we're going to have to, to rotate in and out. Uh, otherwise, we're we're here for too long. Uh, and Adrian, are you there? Yes. Uh, how many Starlings are launching on these? Hey, everyone. Uh, Four. I, I think zero. <laughs> but, oh, you know, that, I, 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 I guess, yeah, I guess under, uh, unless you put out, you know, like face array antennas and things like that on the on the astronauts, I don't think they count as the Starlings. <laughs> but anyways, see you guys uh, until next stream or whatever. <laughs> Farewell, and thanks for all the fish. I don't, I don't know. I just woke up. Um... Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Adrian, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing just fine, Jack. I, uh, well, it's not really morning for me anymore. Um, so uh, it's more like a nice afternoon launch here, but I'm looking forward to this. Only less than two hours to do uh, to go here. Hooray! Let's see here. Trent is asking. I know we all know the answer to this one, but Trent doesn't, so we will tell them. Trent's asking: Is the Falcon Nine already filled with the fuel? Who wants to take that one? All right, fine, no, I will. Falcon 9 is, no, yeah, <laughs> no, sorry, talking while muted there for a second. No, Falcon 9 itself, the rocket, is not fueled. However, Dragon's abort system and reaction control system thrusters are fueled at this point. Uh, uh, they were fueled before the rocket rolled out to the pad uh, because those, um, the Super Dracos have to be able to pull the vehicle away in the event of an abort, so they already have to be fueled, um, and they have to be able to do that during the fueling process, so they have to be fueled ahead of time. Um, it's also different, excuse me, different propellants. Um, there's um, uh, monoprop and uh, that's used in the Dragon thrusters and Super Draco systems. And then there's the cryogenics that are used for the stages. And the first and second stages will begin fueling at T minus 35 minutes and counting. Yeah, we've still got about an hour for that. Yeah, famously, SpaceX wanted to do the load-and-go fueling, where the rocket is fueled with the crew in the capsule. Uh, and and um, I think it's safe to say it took some cajoling for NASA to agree to, to, to do that. It, it took a lot of data review, which, which was very interesting. And it sounded like what NASA was really interested in was just understanding the different parts of the process because for so long nasa had been used to get the vehicle fueled get it 
stable and then send your crew out to the launch pad to board with a fully fueled rocket. Um, and a lot of that just had to do with the sheer amount of time it took to fuel rockets um, and everything. You couldn't put the crew on and then go through a multi-hour fueling process with the crew already on board for a couple of hours before that. But with Falcon 9 being able to do it in 39 or 35 minutes flat, yeah, NASA, uh, SpaceX wanted to do that. NASA originally was against it. And then eventually when they looked at all the data and said, okay, like we'll, we'll definitely, we're, we're okay with this. That's where they're going for now. And in a way, you know, like there, there, there's something to potentially be said for that because you are putting the crew on the vehicle when there's no cryogenics that could accidentally ignite. Um, and when you actually start loading those cryos into the vehicle, your abort system is armed and can pull you away in an instant while you're fueling. So um, for the ground crews, um, it, it could definitely be looked at as the safer of the two options because the ninjas are not having to be on the pad with a fully fueled vehicle. Yeah, that one's always kind of counterintuitive to me. Like, I understand the reluctance on NASA's part to really do anything different or new, um, especially when humans are involved. But yeah, the, it just make it just kind of makes sense. It, it makes sense. You don't you don't want everyone mucking about right there in the in the in the white room with a fueled rocket. <laughs> that seems to be more dangerous to me than you know having the crew nice and safe in the capsule when fueling occurs because if anything happens then they have the abort system anyways um chris moranic thank you for the support they're asking with how often they're becoming reused has there been any discussion of naming falcon 9 first stage boosters like they name the capsules that'd be kind of cool but there's a lot of boosters the names might get overwhelming at that point I can barely keep track of the numbers, Jack. I can't even imagine trying to keep track of names now. Morning, Julia. Good She's morning, been here. Jack. <laughs> I know, but I just, I, you know, just got to say hi. Hi, Julia. Hi, Jack. Um, That makes sense. I, I, you know, let's see here. Although you, name you, them do, like hurricanes. you do keep, uh, you know. <laughs> no, at least. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry, too soon. <laughs> Wait, I, I missed. I do. I missed oh. it. Name them after Hurricane. No, oh God. Too soon. Oh, God. Too soon. Oh, <laughs> too soon. <God>. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I had the most chaos energy on our streams. It might. <laughs> I think it turns out it's Alicia. Hey, man, I got pom poms. <laughs> it's true. You don't threaten me with the pom pom. I, I. We know. We believe you. Uh, Did somebody high, say chaos? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, on high is asking if there's any hydrogen leaks today. Please no, that would be bad because there's no hydrogen involved in this launch system. Um, but funny joke. Mask Dingo gifted five red team memberships. Thank you, Mask Dingo. You know, I think when he asked that question, I heard a, a rocket in the VAB kind of sob a little bit. So Aww. that's not. Well, uh, now I'm thinking of what a rocket sob sounds like, but uh. I digress. The vent, right? Like I would say, it's a vent. <laughs> uh, yes. A vent is a rocket sobbing. Does that mean Starship and and uh, Super Heavy are are like crybabies? Because they vent um, a lot. Well, I cannot go against that logic now that I proposed it. So I would say yes. I love it. It's like I've trapped you. Yep. So right now we're watching them sort of apply a gap filler to the seal and get ready to close the hatch. Is that, is that correct? Is that what's going on right now? It looked um, like... I believe go ahead. Lisa, sorry. Well, yeah. yeah it, just, it looked like um, they had like a, like a cream or something that they were putting in there. So yeah, I think that is the gap filler. Yeah, this is sort of what we were referencing earlier, right? Like they, they, it's like a. You can also kind of think of it as like a grease. It's meant to like get in there and seal all those little imperfections that might be in in different um, parts of a rubber seal. And we've seen them before close this hatch, do a leak check on the capsule, and then go, "Oh, it's not quite right," and have to open it up and sort of reapply or smooth an area out and then go back in and, and, and close the hatch. So sort of what we were talking about earlier, like we, we, we saw like the suit troubleshooting that they were doing that ate up some of their time, but they were ahead of the timeline to start with. And they always put the crew in a little bit early to deal with these things. So yeah, um, greasing up the hatch to seal it. We've seen, uh, we've seen that happen with DM2, right? And at least 
at least DM2. It might have been multiple other crude launches on Dragon where they, they close the hatch, they do the seal check, and then they sort of open things back up again and then close it again. And, you know, the standard turn it off and on again to, to see if it works better. And, it, it you know, it's been fine thus far. Um, beep, beep, beep. Another question about if they have spare gloves or like, you know, spare suit parts if they need to. Um, it's a really good question that now I'm like, I'm kind of itching to ask next time we get a chance. There we go. The hatch is closed. And now that's, they will do a leak check. That's good if you want to go to space, actually. Just yes. as a, like a very high quality note here. Um, closing closing your hatch is good. Yeah, I mean, it, unless you're the rare astronaut that does not want to go to space, that's, then it's bad. Yeah, but... or you're the Martian. <laughs> uh, great, now I have to watch the Martian today. Thanks, Adrian. Wait, no did problem. we just... That was the only... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, just, uh, we just bonded over a, a shared movie reference. That may be the first time ever that that's happened. This is an NSF history moment. <laughs> Daniel B in chat says, a movie Adrian has seen? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, buddy. Sorry, not sorry. Um, let's see here. Don't forget, if you have questions to ask, at NASA Space Flight in chat, and we will answer your question, potentially, as we wait for... This Dragon, launch. we are commencing the health check for launch escape system. Expect a momentary flight computer state change followed by a transition back to pad hatch closed. All right, they're going to check the launch abort system. Dragon, copy. We'll be looking for it. Crazy that they are doing this so often now. Like, uh, I still remember the the nervousness before the first crude dragon flight. And at this point, there's so many flights of them. It's so cool to see. And they never get boring at all. It's, it's such, such an amazing thing to watch every time. Definitely not boring, but perhaps a bit more, um, I don't know, dare I say commonplace? Like, I, I was thinking about this earlier. You know, the first time you do something, everyone's like, ooh, ah. The second time you do it, it's still quite a, you know, quite a spectacle. The fifth time you do it, it's uh, you know, a little bit more feels a little bit more routine, which is which is good. That's what we want it to feel like. It's it's but, the bulkhead of crew launches because it's quite common. I Wow. Yeah. Well, and I mean it's also like interesting to think too, like I mean, from May of twenty 20 right when dragon took its demo to flight uh, counting today this is number uh this is uh th th this is the fifth crew one plus demo two which is six plus axiom which is seven plus inspiration four which is eight so this is their eighth crew flight in just over two and a half years i mean that's a really impressive cadence they fell into right away yeah yeah it's it's honestly quite resounding and this will be um crew dragon endeavors second flight if i'm not mistaken no yes, it, is, me. it is the endurance's it is the endurance's second flight yes endurance, uh, endurance flew the crew three mission in november of 2021 and, and now is back for crew five so cool not only reusing boosters but also reusing capsules it makes well, me happy. not reusing this booster <laughs> No, this, this is, is a new booster. booster. This is 1077 is the booster, right? Indeed. Is this the bridge, bridge booster, booster? Bridge booster. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. <laughs> with the with the ever <laughs> prescient commentary. Yes. Yes, this is the one that hit the bridge in Arizona, was it, Thomas? As they were coming across the interstate there? In Van Horn, Texas, of all places. Van Horn, Texas. It was a Blue Origin there bridge, some people say. It was a Blue Origin. Um, let's see here. I'll try and limit myself on the bad jokes, but no promises here. Adrian just made that common bulkhead joke, which I'm still, I'm not going to ever be able to forgive, just for the record. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so we talked about how the Hypergalls are already on, or, like Dragon is already fueled with them. Um, Endeavor in chat, apt, apt name here, um, although I guess it's Endurance, not Endeavor. Uh, how is dragon fueled? Is the strongback modified to fuel a dragon as well, or does it have an umbilical I somehow haven't spotted? They f they fuel it uh, be before they roll it out, right? Yeah, it's fueled before... Yeah, the dragons are fueled before they're integrated with the rockets, um, so they are fueled over in their own um, processing facility uh, through their own ports and then brought over. So none of the uh, hypergolic load occurs out at the launch pad. Very cool. And that's 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 quite common for everything that usually involves hypergolds. Like that's the, one of the advantage of it. You can put it into different kinds of spacecrafts, and it just sits there, and uh, you don't have to worry about that in your launch countdown. So mm -hmm. that, that I think that happens from time to time in all kinds of different vehicles. Yeah, I mean, SLS came back because they had fueled the solid rocket boosters uh, for their thrust vector control system with the hydrazine uh, propellant needed for that. And they, they rolled it back to the VAB fueled, even though they fuel it out at the launch pad. They rolled it back to the VAB fueled. So exactly as you, as you said, Adrian. Here. Wolfram, thank you for the support. They're asking if DOS installed a, ca a camera inside the capsule. I think that's uh, probably a reference to one of the NASA I'm, feeds we're I'm able always, to pull. <laughs> I'm always, always worried to say no, by the way, if if the question is, did DAS do something? Because at this point, I don't feel qualified to say and no Dragon to that. SpaceX for side hatch leak checks. I don't know, Here he we seemed a little distracted this morning. Who knows, he's climbing around in there. Okay, Josh, uh, we identified a uh, potential piece of FOD on the side hatch seal. When we were inspecting everything, so the closeout team is proceeding to open the hatch to address that before closing and reperforming the leak check. For big picture awareness, we still have approximately uh, 12 minutes remaining in the margin for this timer to perform this action, so we'll, we'll be able to run through everything with uh, out issue here. Okay, Dragon Copies will be opened up the side hatch and uh, taking a look at the pod, and we've got 12 minutes of margin. Appreciate the heads up. Good right, you heard it. They've got... They've got 12 minutes of margin, and they are going to, like we just talked about a moment ago, they're going to open up the hatch, check for FOD, and then close the hatch again and, and redo the seal check. If you don't know, FOD is foreign object debris. It just means something that is there that should not be there, like a little crumb of something or, you know, just some debris it's... in the seal that you don't want. It's a crumb from the Oreo that they shoved Thank in that guy. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you see, you were my, you were my people, Alicia. This is that is perfect. That is that is that is absolutely. I was just thinking I would do a cookie callback, and you you beat me to it. Oh, uh, you have had your coffee this morning. <laughs> I have. <laughs> Here, Chris Watt is asking, how long is Crew Five going up to the ISS for, and is there anyone coming off of the ISS? Well, Crew Four is going to return, right? Is that how that works? That is indeed how it works. So, uh, Shell Lengren, Bob Hind, Jessica Watkins, and Samantha Cristoforetti will return on Crew Four after about a week of handover operations. Uh, direct handover between crew four and crew five, and then they will come home. There will also be a change of command ceremony on board the International Space Station during that time. As Samantha from East is the current commander of the path, and she will pass that off to the next commander before um, she boards the Dragon capsule to come home with her crew. We got like we got like eighty percent of that, Chris. You're a little bit choppy Robo there. Robo, Chris. The end. <laughs> but yes, there uh, is a crew. Gotcha. There is a crew returning. Crew four will be uh, splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico, if I'm not mistaken. And crew five will be staying on station. Um, Mike is asking. Well, first they're saying thanks for the excellent coverage. So thank you, Mike. They're asking. What is the minimum G load, or sorry, maximum G load the astronauts will experience on ascent? 
Sawyer, were you saying that was like three G's? Wait, Sawyer's not here. I need more sleep. Okay, hey, somebody else. Just in case. Oh. He... Yeah, am I? Am I? Am I okay or am I okay or robot-y? You're good. You're good. I am good. Okay, uh, it's about three G's for ascent, and it is more on descent for dragon. Um, I think it peaks out at around four point five G's total for the mission envelope, but I believe it gets to about three or four during ascent. But it, but the peak 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 G forces are during return and entry. Got it. Um, let's see here. Michael, thank you for the support. They're saying that my grand... Oh, huh? My grand rat? My grand rat Lillian would like to know if the astronaut's ears pop while traveling into space. Does anyone know the answer to this? You know, I know that happens nope. when you're like flying on a plane, but the pressure in the capsule stays constant, right? I mean, yeah, it should stay constant, right? Exactly. Like that's, that's the point of their pressuring it. They They want to have... <laughs> constant uh constant pressure all the time in the capsule so i think your ears shouldn't pop got it okay pl46u3 really 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 wants to know what's displayed on their monitors they must have asked it a dozen times or more what is displayed on the monitors inside the capsule Yeah, so it's various health levels of the vehicle ways to monitor fueling, uh, various vehicle states as they climb uphill, abort, various abort modes as they become available. Um, when they're in orbit, it'll give them their orbital uh, information, range, distance, bearing to the ISS. Um, uh, ba basically, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's basically like a big gigantic iPad that, that just cycles through vehicle systems and, um, and vehicle health. Yeah. And also their in-flight Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe the Martian. What was it uh, during Inspiration Four? Yeah, I was gonna say like during Inspiration Four, Chris Simbersky on his personal iPad was like watching Spaceballs as they came back for reentry, which I thought what was a, really cool. Yeah, what a legend! How yeah. could you watch a movie on reentry? I'm sorry, I would be staring out the window, like Same. drooling. So, That's amazing. It could also just now be like I'm, a stress. He like doesn't a stress have a window kind of to stare out of. Oh, that's true. <laughs> So, no. so there's no real window to look out of with that. Um, it, it went with reentry because of where the Draco thrusters are for the Super Dracos are for um, for everything on that regard. And there's also really nothing for the mission specialists to do. It's a it's a pilot and commander heavy event. So at that point, the the two in the side seats are sort of just along for the ride. And believe it or not, Alicia, this is a fun fact that I love astronauts who sat on the mid deck of the space shuttle the three who would sit there for like the hours after they boarded and then before liftoff they would fall asleep on the mid deck yeah. and there are some audio ones where you can hear the commander and pilot go you guys awake down there two minutes like <laughs> oh man yeah. um yeah they, they they would doze off on the mid deck of the shuttle yeah it sounds... I definitely saw Anna give a yawn earlier so she might be falling asleep inside the, the capsule right now I mean, I, 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 mean, I get it. You're, there's a whole long process before you even get to, be, to get to sit in that seat. And by then, you've been awake for a long time. It's a high-stress situation, I'm sure. And, you know, when you, can, when you can catch some wings, catch some wings. I mean, I totally um, get that as well, but, but I'm now curious. The closeout team was able to open the side hatch and remove the uh, hair that they identified as FOD. They've closed the hide hatch. The side hatch and are stepping into their leak checks right now. We are right on schedule for launch today. Hair. Hair. Uh, great news, and we're standing by for that leak check. Thanks. Wow, a hair you is You know, I almost said it's probably a piece of hair. Yeah, like, I almost said a piece of hair, but then I was like, oh, no, they all wear ball caps and everything to protect from that, so I second-guessed myself, and it was a piece of hair. <laughs> huh. Wow. I'm gl Amazing. I I'm glad they How? found it. That could have been hairy. Look, Stop but it. they all no. have... <laughs> wow. 
Yeah, so and I guess I don't but, know but, if I'd be able to fly on... A health check for a launch escape system a second time. Expect a momentary flight computer state change, followed by that transition back to pad hatch closed. I don't know that I'd be able to fly on Dragon, given uh, the beer. Good read back. This is, this is also another interesting thing that I want to point out. So... Josh Cassada uh, has been the one as the pilot answering, but as someone else, correct me if I'm wrong, I always remember the commander from previous missions being the one that communicated at this point in, in, in the flight. Am I just misremembering that? Like, I don't, I don't remember hearing Megan MacArthur when she was the pilot. I don't remember hearing her talk. This is the part where I wait this. for Thomas is, is there, to answer. That's, I'm looking at Thomas, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why me? <laughs> <laughs> because, bro. I, I I have the same question. I, In my memory, the commander has been the one doing most of the capsule communication. So I'm curious why we're not hearing Nicole Mann. Yeah, I wonder if there's maybe something with like the umbilical calm with her, like everything else is fine but or, or something. But that that's weird. Yeah, I don't know why we're not hearing Nicole to give the answers to this as the commander. I feel like if there's something wrong with your umbilical comms, you uh, should fix that and not go to space. You're not go Right, right. I'm I'm spitballing yeah, here, but um, also to the also. To... Seems like all their comms checked out, though. Go ahead for Dragon. There she is. Hey Duke. So good news all around, but the Dragon is looking happy and healthy with no further issues aside from the uh, reperforming the leak check here. Uh, you guys are all aware for our seat three, and we're going to delay any further steps until we get on orbit, but we're in a good state there. Other than that, Dragon and F9 are both looking healthy, and the weather's looking good. That's what we want to hear. Dragon healthy. and Falcon Dragon. 9. The crew is good, and we're standing by. Are healthy, and the weather is good. And with that, please could confirm also just that you are to... ready for comm checks with your Falcon 9 operators. Dragon, ready for palm tracks with Falcon 9. SpaceX copies, stand by one. Okay, so, uh, and, and just to, for the comm check issue that we were just talking about there, um, so it looks like the the Merritt Island launch annex, Myla, had a comms issue, and that's why Josh Dragon, was the one GNC communicating on there at check. first. GNC, your dragon has you loud and clear. GNC, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by propulsion engineer. Dragon, prop on countdown one, comm check. Prop, dragon has you loud and clear. Prop, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check with the avionics engineer. Dragon, avionics on countdown one, comm check. <laughs> Avionics, the Dragon, loud and clear. Avionics, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by ground segment engineer. Dragon, ground segment on one, comm check. Ground segment, Dragon, has you loud and clear. Ground segment, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by launch control. Dragon, launch control on countdown one, comm check. Launch control, Dragon, loud and clear. Launch control, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the Chief Engineer. Dragon, CE on countdown one, comm check. CE, Dragon, loud and clear. CE, loud and clear also. This completes the Falcon 9 Responsible Engineer comm checks. Comm checks complete. All right. So the. Yeah, those should be it for in terms of comm checks here uh, ahead of liftoff. Um, and I need to correct something that I just said. This is a wonderful moment of different acronyms. Meet, uh, the same acronym can mean different things. Um, I read the acronym as MILA, the Merritt Island Launch Annex, had had an issue, and that's why Josh <laughs> was talking instead of um, 
instead of uh, Nicole. Apparently, that same acronym is also Michael Lopez Alegria's initials, and the reference was actually to the commander of Axiom 1 had an issue and his pilot had to do some comms uh, as they were getting in. That might be what happened to Cole, but just wanted to clarify that Myla did not have an issue today. It was just an unfortunate acronyms can mean different things. I love that you are knowledgeable enough about this stuff to have multiple acronyms for the same thing, like in your, <laughs> just, it's perfect. Thank you, Chris, for being you. Um, uh, okay. You're welcome. <laughs> While we wait for the next step here, I'm just going to run through some of these. Infinity Space News, thank you for the support. They say, how many astronauts can Dragon transport? I've heard six, possibly eight max. And what kind of challenges would carrying more astronauts add to the overall mission? I think it's four. Is four the, 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 the cap? The crew capacity is up to seven. I've never seen that many in there. It'd be like a clown car, yeah. I feel like. But it, they say it but... is up to seven. So it's a... It's, it's a it's one of those like tricky things it's 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 basically up to seven if you had an emergency where everyone is on the oh we're getting you a little choppy yeah. again chris i'm into uh but yeah i think at one point they they thought they could do a larger number and they sort of scaled that back yeah, I think he was saying in the event of an emergency, if they needed to throw some extra people in there from the ISS or wherever. Yeah, but I think practically, I mean, yeah, if you don't want to be in clown car mode, um, it's like four. I love that it just casually is called now clown, clown car mode. That's... Yeah, you know, <laughs> yes, people people understand what you know what we're saying. It's we're very it's a highly technical discussion here, Adrian. <laughs> Oreos I'm and clown sorry. Cars. <laughs> um, let's see. Liz McQuaid, thank you for the support. They say sending humans up to the ISS is always exciting. I, I'm I'm inclined to agree. Yes. Indeed. Concur. In, yeah. Every I feel like every time you put humans on a rocket. That basically Dragon screams SpaceX, something exciting will good happen. Good side hatch leak check. Yay, good leak check. Dragon copy. That is great news. <laughs> and for some reason, Mask Dingo in chat just says hashtag hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Alexander Ash, thank you for the support. They say Elon wants a million people on Mars by 2050. So how are we supposed to be a multi-planet species if it takes this long to launch four astronauts 65 miles into space? This has to be faster or else failure. Interesting choice of words there. Um, yeah, I mean, that, this, is, this is all part of the process is doing this more and over and over again and making it become routine. But we are also not just going to do this willy nilly. I mean, you're we're st we're still fundamentally tra like strapping humans to a rocket, so uh, some precautions I think are are warranted. Um, I mean, you don't you don't just board a uh you know a plane um at the airport and just take off willy nilly. I mean, the flight attendants come through the aisle and make sure everyone's seat belted in and your tray tables up and you're not using your phone and you're in airplane mode. You know all that stuff. Um, oh. What point of the count today do they put their phones or iPads into space capsule mode? <laughs> I, that is terrible. That is terrible. I hate myself. Oh, no. <laughs> um, also, also, to just add to that, I mean, they are not going to, like, any place. They are going to a, a flying science laboratory, right? So there's probably also some extra precautions because you don't want to compromise the environment of a science laboratory in any way. So... Um, I would imagine maybe um, down the line it might be different if you just go to, I'm saying just, a colony because that's not a known sterile environment where experiments are conducted. But science laboratory so, aside, they're going into space, right? So space yeah. is a hostile environment no matter what, no matter when. When we have colonies on Mars, you're still going to need to make sure there's not hair in your door to make sure that you are airtight, you know, we cannot breathe the vacuum of space. So it is still safety and it's going to, I, I believe, still going to take 
a while before they really kind of sort all this out. Practice makes perfect. That's all it is. You know what? I, yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with that. I say that you can breathe the vacuum of space and just wait. I'm going to try it and prove everyone wrong. Yeah, you, uh, you, you hop on comms after you do that and let us know how it goes. <laughs> oh, man. Um, Jerwa says, hello, world, and is, has a nice, generous amount of support there. Thank you, Jerwa, so much for everything. Um, Andy P., Thank you for the support. They say, what's the procedure to go to the bath or go to bath in the capsule? I think they're talking about the bathroom. There is a bathroom. It's on the roof of the capsule. Um, if they need to go like right now, they have maximum absorbency garments, also known as diapers on right now. Um, I am 18% carbon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for becoming a pad rat nice member. One. Is that accurate? I think that's accurate. Um, uh, let's see. Lindsay, thank you for the support. They say, when does crew four come home? Do we know when that's scheduled? Soon. Uh, I know it's like next after. week, right? Yeah. It's soon. I'm not sure if there's an exact day yet. I think so far it's still, uh, like 10 days. Oh yeah. yeah. Back channel, uh, October 12th is, is that in the back channel? October so 12th is it, it will be soon. Yeah. Cool. Um, do do do. Taran is asking, is there ever any extra fuel stored in Dragon's Trunk? Uh, interesting question, but Dragon's Trunk does not work that way. So no is the answer there. Sorry to burst your bubble. Sorry to pop your tank. I don't. I don't know. Um, Josh is asking, how long is it from launch to docking with the ISS? What's the ride uphill like on this one? Twenty nine hours. Oh man! Imagine being in a car for twenty nine hours straight. Yeah. At least. Pack some snacks. Yeah. Right. But no. But leave the hair. Leave the hair at home. But on, it's even worse than that because on a car you can at least like pull over and make a short break or something. Like you cannot you cannot pull over a dragon and just make a break. That's true. Although you can, I, I'm assuming, unstrap yourself and sort of float around uh, and enjoy some some zero g. Yeah, we were just talking yeah, about that. True. They can take their suits off after they've launched, and then they put them back on right before they talk. But 29 hours is rather long. It's, it's definitely uh, longer than it, it has been in the past, I think. Um, interesting. I wonder why that is. I think it just has to do with how they're heading out there. Just being able to meet up with it. It's always these, like, how, how to plan the trajectory so you meet up with the ISS, right? Um, yeah. I mean... Sometimes it works out for you and you can be there first, and uh, sometimes you're like, nope, it's the long way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded of the Simpsons episode where Homer takes a shortcut, and it's a terrible shortcut, and then he's like, and we shall never speak of this again. <laughs> <laughs> it took us 29 hours to get to the station, and we shall never speak of this again. Um, let's see here. Musical Wolves, thank you for the support. No, the FOD was not a piece of a glove. It was hair, which is interesting. Um, I would not have expected that to be an issue. Let's see. Easton Manning, thank you for the support. They said they hope the suits have independent ventilation systems. They do. Nice Taco Bell joke there. Inner Space, thank you for the support. They say, I, d I generally don't chat, but I'm here for most launches and wanted to thank you all for the great coverage. Well, thank you, Inner Space. You keep watching them, we'll keep doing them. Uh, Ryan, thank you for the support. They say, it currently takes hours to close and prepare a capsule and to open it upon arrival. How long do you think it will be until that can be done in minutes, like in sci-fi and in airliners? Uh, you know, I'm going to say... 10 years. 
I'm sure that's a disappointing answer to a lot of people. I, but I mean, it's not really minutes. Sometimes in airliners, even like we have not perfected that as well as yeah. as a species so far. Yeah, I mean, how many times has anybody here gotten onto a plane? You know, sat down, seat belted in, sort of arranged your snacks and knickknacks, and put your iPad in the seat back for when you want it later in the flight, and blah blah blah, and then only to hear you know the pilot come on the radio or the intercom and be like yeah folks we got a bad door seal we're gonna need to ask you to step off the plane and you're like no why <laughs> like that happens too happens. don't forget that happens yep that was my best chuck yeah, Yeager pilot voice one so far <laughs> Yeah, some people in chat. Austin saying never. Kyle is saying never. All right, well, I'm glad y'all are real lucky. Maybe I should fly with you guys. Um, Mike Bundy. Thank you for the support. This is they're talking about why someone was answering instead of uh, instead of someone else. They're saying it's called crew resource management. The tasks are divided. That makes sense. Um, Chris Roberts, thank you for the support. They say crew la crew five launch on the fifth, which happens to also be my thirty fifth birthday. Well, happy birthday, Chris! Chat, I happy want to see birthday. everyone saying happy birthday to Chris. Thank Chris. You mean like everyone, like everyone in the chat? Yeah. If if I don't see you saying happy birthday, Chris, in chat, we're not friends. It's official. I'm on record here. By the way, if I recall, didn't uh, Inspiration Four launch on the fourth as well? Oh, that's delightful. Okay, so, yeah, 16th. fours and fives. Uh, one of them I thought was... Oh, no, Crew 4 was one of the days on the 4th. Look at that. Oh, Chad, is, Chad is blowing up with happy birthdays Avalanche for Chris. Avalanche happy birthdays. Amazing. <laughs> Best so birthday cool ever. Hey, you made it another Great. orbit around the sun. Happy, happy birthday. <laughs> Great um, job, Chad. We're going to light you a candle for your birthday, Chris. Well, is, it, is it one candle or is it nine? It's nine, I guess. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I mean, technically it's really even ten, one. right? <laughs> well, okay, we'll, but then we'll light nine and then we'll light one. But the nine are kind of clustered really close together, so you can't really tell they're individual. Okay, I'll stop. Um, Crafty Geek, thank you for the support. They're saying, do we have an ETA or no earlier than time for Boeing's Starliner's next launch, uncrewed or crewed? What's going on with Starliner? Yeah, so Starliner is targeting a launch in March to the International Space Station for its crew flight test on top of an Atlas V rocket from neighboring Pad 41 uh, here at the Cape. So as of right now, Starliner on track for its a, it's a for crew flight test. That'll be the first time it carries crew. It's about a week-long mission. It's not going to be a longer one um, like uh, like demo two was uh, because we don't need it uh, with Dragons doing the crew rotations right now. And then if crew flight test goes well in march that should set starliner up for the starliner one mission um following there potentially as early as um september of Oct or october of next year makes sense thank you chris justin wayne asking is the lr11350 crane that's the you see the very tip of it on the right side of the screen there in front of the launch tower there we go Oh, different crane was the one we saw the tip of. Um, Justin's asking, is the crane still down because of Ian, or did they lay it back down for launch? Buddy, it's not laying down. You're looking at a different crane. Um, the LR11350 is standing yeah, tall it, there on the right side of the screen. Go ahead, Chris. Yes, indeed. That came back up uh, for operations pretty quick after Ian passed as Impressive. they got back in normal ops here. Yeah. But the Space Center as a whole also didn't take a lot of damage from, from Hurricane Ian um, or, or anything like that. The Space Center was back open very, very quickly. Um, no major damage. Maybe a building lost a panel here or there throughout the Space Center. But it was uh, Ian was benign for the Space Center, not benign for other areas of Florida, though. Yeah. Really, the heart goes out to everybody in Florida whose everyday life was affected by Ian. Seriously, hang in there. I know some people are still dealing with flooding and whatnot, and it's it's not you know 
it's not something to uh to take lightly that's for sure um belgarade thank you for becoming a capcom member if you guys don't know we've got a membership program it's part of youtube you should be able to see the little uh sign up button right there below the timeline you might not see it on mobile but uh it's there uh, trust me if you go in the browser and and or you're on your computer the membership program is basically a monthly um commitment where you support what we do at various levels and the levels have cool names one of those levels is named capcom and at capcom level and above you get discord access we have a members discord it's a vibrant community with all kinds of awesome little niches in it there's a, a tech chat channel a gaming channel um, still, no one has rescued the three Kerbals I stranded on Eve and posted my save game in the uh, in the gaming channel. So that's something you could do if you felt so inclined. Um, I did strand three Kerbals on Eve like a like a horrible mad scientist. Um, but point being, the membership program is such a huge huge way to support what we do. It's a huge part of allowing us to do the things that we do. I mean, right now we're pulling nasa fiber feeds with equipment that we were able to purchase and install thanks to the members supporting what we do so if you've Dragon ever SpaceX, considered the closeout team has departed the crew arm and with that ground is going to cycle the orbit tank isolation valves to equalize low flow pressure ah the orbit tank isolation valve. all right sounded like dragon copied <laughs> Jack, I love you. I will, I will never not <laughs> pretend like I know so what something perfect. is. Oh, all the you isolation to, valve. <laughs> yeah. All you have to do to sound like you know what's going on is say, oh, the blank. And then everyone's like, wow, he, that guy really knew what was going on. He clearly he repeated the words. Um, Don't but tell yeah. all of our secrets, Jack. Oh, wow. Oh, busted. Um, but thank you, Belgarade, for uh, becoming a Capcom member. We super appreciate all of our members. Thank you so much for the support. Um, wow, Marius being kind enough to super chat to say happy birthday to Chris. And Keith is asking, do astronauts experience jet lag when returning? No, it's rocket lag. Hey. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think no, I, I think they're a... only I th I think they're some of the only tra travelers who actually get pre jet lag since they sync their clock to the to the docking timing and after. No, we're I think we're starting to lose you again, Chris. TC, it's that's a that's a fascinating question of of when that sort of whoa, what time zone am I in would kick in for them. Yeah, super curious. Um, let's see here. Like Answering all some of more the time of your... zones. True. <laughs> time is relative. Time is a flat I, I circle. Have a question. I have a question about that question, actually, because I don't know something here, and now I'm curious if somebody knows here. Are they still operating on a 24-hour clock on the ISS on the same time zone they're departing in? Or what's the... Operation time they're using. I don't know off the top of my head. Maybe one of the smutter it's, folks in chat here knows. Chris? It's, it's the, UTC, right? Am I a robot? You're good. Sometimes. You are correct, Alicia. I don't know if I'm a robot, but it is UTC. Yeah, UTC is the time zone that the ISS uses. But And then the crew sort of has to shift around to say, okay, well, we would normally be sleeping at this time, but Dragon's arriving for docking at this time, so we can't be asleep. Um, so they have to sort of sleep shift to match when the vehicles are getting there, but then they go back to normal wake and sleep times based on the UTC clock. That makes sense. And NASA Spaceflight Actual, Chris Bergen in chat, emphatically saying Zulu, which is also another name for UTC time. Um, hi, Chris B. Have we talked about shuttle yet on the stream? I might have missed it. Shuttle, horses. <laughs> <laughs> That's for crispy. We definitely had shuttle earlier. Okay, good. Um, and yeah, and we you know just gotta throw in a quick horses for for crispy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, Bernardo, kind of off topic, is asking: Is Falcon Heavy scheduled for sometime soon? I think the next Falcon Heavy out of the out of Florida 
which I guess is the only place they can launch it, Der, is um, USSF 44. And I think that's... Do we know when USSF 44 yeah. is going? Is that, does that have a date yet? I have not personally seen a date, just October. Do we know USSF 44 yet, Thomas? Just Yeah, he's shaking his head. Just October is what we've got so far. Alex in our back channel saying late October. And, 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 and net October. Yeah. Got it. And they have the boosters in second stage for that for USSF 44 in the horizontal integration facility right now. So uh, maybe it's payload side that they're waiting on or something. That's a, that's a classified mission for the United States Space Force, hence the name USSF 44. Let's see. Peter Ford is asking, what are the pre-launch health check protocols with regards to colds or the flu? They have to go into some kind of like quarantine? Yeah, that's a great question. So they do quarantine for about 10-ish days uh, prior to liftoff. Um, and that is outside of most of the incubation periods of the stuff that we would really be concerned with. Um, you know, common colds, coronavirus, flu, you know, other types of viral infections. That That's enough to, to have a... Uh, to have a good idea that they're not infected. They also undergo medical screenings um, quite consistently. Sometimes some of their family members also enter quarantine to be able to um, to interact with them uh, a bit more um, and also undergo that as well. But in general, that's how... Uh, that that's how NASA and Roscosmos and and by extension ESA, the European Space Agency, and JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration uh, Space Agency, and CSA with Canada all all operate as well because Dragon, the U.S. and you Russia are both go have for those uh, human. When ready, report go for launch. Check it out. The cars are leaving the pad. Dragon copies. Woohoo! Woo Good to be back. And there goes the last car leaving the pad. So at this point, we would say it's just the four people who plan to leave the launch pad in a very different vehicle are the only ones out there right now. Awesome. And I believe they mentioned that next is, or right now would be the LES arm, which is arming the launch escape system using the onboard Dracos to fire the capsule away were something to go wrong at any point before liftoff and during liftoff technically too. And that's sort of yeah. the, the step I, they're going to take before they start fueling the rocket so that if anything, like you said, Sawyer, goes awry while they're fueling, no worries, Dracon can go bye-bye. Yeah, and and it's probably a good idea since we just ticked under the one hour mark to talk about how this Take count. Take dragon is in section six. Crew five is go for launch. Copy that, Nicole. Crew five is go for launch. You heard it there. Crew fives go. Indeed they are. Uh, so coming up in about 10-ish minutes, and this can vary a little bit from the published timeline, uh, we will have the crew access arm pulled back uh, to its initial 90-degree retract um, position, more or less 90 degrees, uh, from the side of the hatch. They will then arm the launch escape system um, uh, around... 38 to 40 minutes again this can happen earlier in the timeline if, if they're if they're ahead of things and that sets them up fully once you are the launch abort system or launch escape system as Sawyer was saying to be able to pull them out that is that is what sets them up to be able to enter the auto sequence and the start of fueling operations at minus 35 minutes and counting good deal Rusty Shackelford in chat, shasha, uh, says Nicole is enthusiastic. Which, yeah, I, I'm, I'm feeling the enthusiasm here. I like it. Pocket sand. I am too. Uh -huh. It's nice to hear the commander have that enthusiasm, isn't it? It is. I mean, and how could it's infectious? And how could you not be uh, feeling that excitement if you were on Dragon right now? Um, let's see. Brian V is asking, or maybe it's Brian Five. Um, wow, Saturn Five joke. Anybody? No. Okay. <laughs> um, Brian V is asking, how long of provisions do they have on the Dragon? Can they last for days? What is the what are the stores on Dragon like in terms of snacks and food and air 
how long can they hang out on Dragon? Like if they, you know, for whatever reason need to. So in general, dragons can free fly for about four to five days. Um, so if you think about, if you think in rough terms, it takes roughly a day to reach the International Space Station after liftoff. It takes roughly a day to come back and you build in a couple days margin on the back end of that, just in case you undock thinking weather is going to be okay in one location and you end up having to wave off for a day after you have undocked although they try to really not undock until they know they're okay to come home um so they pack a couple of extra days provisions inside just on the just so on the back end you're okay if, if you need to and stay up a little bit longer um and yeah go ahead you'll also hear when they dock to the space station they will actually give a read back to hawthorne typically of what provisions they've used uh how much water they've yep. had how many of their snacks they've had so they can keep track of that as well if they need to extend their orbit. Yep. And then all of their provisions for the for the six month mission are are handled by the Cargo Dragon resupply missions to the station itself. I like that, Chris. I like that you're saying provisions. It sounds very technical and fancy. Whereas Sawyer and I are saying snacks, which <laughs> snacks, snacks. <laughs> you know, the Oreos. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hey, yeah. callbacks. Helmet Oreos. <laughs> it sounds it sounds way more relaxed like that. It sounds like, hey, we are going to space and bring some snacks. <laughs> can can, can you tell I'm the product of a much different era of space exploration? <laughs> one of my favorite moments of listening to to a shuttle mission audio after they got up there on flight day one was when the crew couldn't find where the utensils had been stowed because they oh, weren't gosh. in the locker that was marked. And the ground had to go figure it out, and the ground couldn't figure it out for a little bit either of where the utensils were. <laughs> uh, shout out to Atlantis, because it was an Atlantis flight on that one. But that was funny. We're, we've got the food, but how do we eat it? <laughs> Further evidence that Atlantis is the best shuttle. I saw Sawyer unmuted. I, I, Sawyer, are you going to dispute I, this? I, I, I have a uh, <laughs> uh, I'm trying not uh, to say the words. Endeavor's the best shuttle. Oops, said it. <laughs> um, I have see, to rep Jack C for obvious reasons, but <laughs> that's fair. That's Jack, fair. I'll give you, I'll give you that, Alicia. Yeah, <laughs> Jack, I'm Team Atlantis as well, her, so. but I but but I have a question here, Jack. Why is not finding stuff evidence for Atlantis being the best shuttle? Just because it's a it's a delightful story. Okay. Sometimes it's not about functionality; it's about delight. Okay. <laughs> Just look at Apple products. Yeah. Oh. Um, Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. You mean Apple who's switching to USB C? What? Hmm? I don't know if they actually are, but I'd be happy if they did. Um Zeta Infinite, thank you for becoming a red team member. Also cool name. Zeta Infinite. Ooh, thank you. I don't know. It needs like a it needs a sound effect. Um Thank you for that though. Mark says donation for a new antenna for Robo Chris. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> It, it it is time for my uh, five thousand kilometer antenna replacement. Yes, we are we are at the whims of the electromagnetic spectrum. Unfortunately, conservative space nerd, thank you for the support there. Don Rubato, thank you for the support. They say we need a pirate ship charter out of Canaveral. There is a pirate ship out there, isn't there? It's not just in Boca Chica. Oh. I don't think we have a pirate ship here in Port Canaveral, but there are pirate ships along the eastern coast. But I don't think we have one that sails out of Port Canaveral. No. Well, I thought that was like kind of a Isn't mandatory, there... like. Well, Go ahead. Well, we don't have like a real pirate ship, but I thought we had a little tourist pirate ship that we could kind of see with fleet cam sometimes. There's that like a docked, pirate like, mini golf. Yeah, exactly, Alicia. That's what I'm there thinking. There you go. Mini golf down there. <laughs> so you would go as oh, far as to say there are none of them here? Stop it. Uh, <laughs> Stop it. There are uh, the real ones. We oh should go God. see them. Stop it. <laughs> what have I done? Don, this is all your fault. In... I looked high, oh, and I there's looked a cruise low, ship but I did not look far. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, Michael Ladd, thank you for the support. I'm just going to move on. Uh, <laughs> SA, thank you for the support as well. They're saying, will Atlas pack, will the Atlas pack be the first manned mission that, from that pad, or has there previously been a previous bracket series? Oh, I, 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 I think I know what they're, are, are they're asking about Atlas and Crew Flight. They're probably talking about Starliner. 
Yes. Um, Chris, do you want to try and parse this question? Yeah, I, 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 th- I think I've got what they're, what they're, what's primarily being asked here um, for that. Um, so for broadcast... Well, you're while well, you're trying to brain that, Chris. Well, I do Atlas want to point could, out yeah, that there is, is a being, there is a cruise ship on well, screen because right Atlas above the launch tower. I yeah. I am kind of scared about that, but hopefully it'll get out of the way. Anyways, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. Oh, I might have ruined things. <laughs> well, ruined well if I'm understanding I, the I question correctly, seen and and the question, but. <sighs> Go ahead, Chris. Oh, sorry. I, I guess that's a buffering thing. Um, my, my apologies there. Um, yeah, I say if what you're asking is about Atlas and Starliner, uh, the crew flight test for Atlas and Starliner will be the first time that crew launches off of Pad 41 at the Cape. The previous Mercury Atlas flights were off of LC-14 at the Cape. Um, so, yeah, Atlases have flown humans before very different versions of the atlases uh but from a different launch pad if that's not what you mean please re-ask the, the pl- please clarify for us uh my, my apologies on that one if, if i'm not understanding you yeah, correctly th- thank you for that chris i i you you figured that out better than i think i would have been able to let's see continuing to answer your questions as the clock ticks down we're about t minus 50 seconds or 50 minutes on the button apparently i need more coffee john gomez is asking do they perform the same leak check on return to ground from the space station i'm not sure why they would want to do that but i i I suppose it would make sense just to you know double check like you're talking about for during re-entry right um I, okay that would make that would make more sense i read this question as like once they're on the ground or splash down would they do a leak check um i know they check for like hypergolic uh you know residue and whatnot but is that, an, is that right, another... they have a they have a sniffer that goes out that they wave around the dragon once it splashes down to make sure that all of the dangerous uh gases and everything has completely vented out and that there's no hazard to crew or anyone on the rescue boat or on the actual recovery boat. Speaking of a boat, there is another, there's another boat right there. Um, cruising on to the right side of the frame. I wonder if that's range the amount, or what? The amount of yeah. boats that are there right now is stressing me out. Is that supposed to be cleared out at a certain point? That's why I'm wondering if it's a range asset. Yeah, um, I guess we'll wait. The wake right behind it. We'll wait to see what we hear. Um, Jonathan Lippert is asking: Could NASA or SpaceX deploy CubeSats or payload from the trunk when launching a crew? I'm looking at you, Sawyer. Sorry, did I ask that one more time? Uh, can SpaceX or NASA deploy CubeSats or payload from the trunk when launching a crew? Uh, I don't believe they would deploy it directly while the crew is there and on board, but they definitely bring things up in the trunk, which is the unpressurized portion of the vehicle. Although there is also a pressurized part, but uh, that you can use to take things and attach them as experiments to the ISS. And I'm sure there might be a way, but I don't believe they do it while the crew is on board. Makes sense. I I just love the casualness with which we name that part of the vehicle trunk. Like it's yeah, it's the trunk. Whatever you need that's not pressurized, you can put right there. Um, like the trunk of the shuttle. Did the shuttle have a trunk? Oh my god! It had of a payload it bay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Not I'm sorry. Trunk. I thought I thought it was something <laughs> different than the payload bay. I was like, wow, did I just learn something new about the shuttle? You got me. The payload bay is the trunk. All right. Fair. Fair. Just a reminder but, that but there is no the- trunk on uh, dragon that's where the docking adapter is <laughs> <laughs> oh and crispy in chat is saying shade mid bay like, lockers i mid do mid bay lockers count as a trunk we're getting into philosophical trunk questions here which i apologize for let's see uh 
Lindsay is asking, since Nicole and Josh were transferred from Starliner to Dragon, will another crew be transferred over to Starliner from Dragon? How is that whole shuffle Vision going operators to work on out? Countdown. Oh, hang on. Pulling is complete. The team has pulled go for crew access arm retract LES arm. Propellant load and launch. For all operators in MCCX and firing room four, both control rooms will go into lockdown at T-minus 45 minutes and will remain in that state until launch escape system is disarmed. All operators are to remain at their console, maintain a sterile cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming of the launch escape system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent, no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD and they will approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence and immediately proceed into launch abort. T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off, relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. Launch control at this time may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. Launch control copies proceeding to arm crew arm for movement. All right, crew arm's going to retract, and they're going to arm the launch escape system. Love it. Let's go to space today, how about? 45 minutes in the count. And the crowd chants, crew, crew, crew. <laughs> I saw it's that a, coming from a mile away. It's a thing now. It's a thing now, okay? Crew access arm retraction started. And the chat goes crew, crew, crew. And the arm retract continues, or starts and continues. All right, we'll continue to answer your questions here. Did we answer Lindsay's question? As to whether or not they'll transfer a crew from Starliner to Dragon in return for transferring, sorry, from Dragon to Starliner in return for doing the opposite here? I believe they will not. Uh, I think it's uh, Barry Wilmore and Sunita Williams who will who are announced to fly on Boeing's crew test right now. But I'm not. I I do not think they are pulled from a Dragon mission. Um, Got it. For that, but at least I'm not aware of that as uh, out of my head right now. But maybe somebody in the back channel can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, they're not pulled from Dragon. As Chris is saying. Right. Got it. Right, those eight uh, Starliner flights will have their own crews. Tom the Toad is asking, what is the most acronym-heavy launch vehicle, shuttle or SLS? I mean, SLS, the name of it, is an acronym. Uh, don't forget well, the shuttle was STS. Fair. I like how you both jumped on that, like, immediately. <laughs> We can, I, I, we can see the shuttle fans. We can see you from a mile away. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> they get rid of us. <laughs> they get I mean, more. The, it's tricky because you have you know a lot of similar acronyms though as well between SLS and shuttle. You both have the SRBs. Uh, I mean, you've got the core tank, whereas the shuttle was the ET, the external tank. And technically, you can make anything to an acronym when it comes to NASA stuff. You talk about the OMS engine. Crew of access arm so, retraction complete. I mean, even Soyuz is TMA, right? Everything's got acronyms. Mm -hmm. Don't look at the meatball. Don't look at it. ACBAA. Everything can be an acronym. <laughs> don't, don't look at the meatball. Just don't look at it. Oh, no. Now you said it. What's wrong with the meatball? It is hard to unsee. The um the logo is offset to the left. It was not fully painted center in the middle of the meatball. 
Uh, I'm being told I, I missed an opportunity to reference the song that Tom the Toad's name is from. How'd you end up in the road, Tom? There we go. Reference acknowledged. <laughs> um, wow, Joe, thank you for becoming a launch director member. Super duper appreciate that. We hope you enjoy all the perks in the membership program that you now have access to. And stay tuned to NASA Space Flight Live episodes for your name at the end of the episode. So thank you so much, Joe. Really, really appreciate that. It's a huge amount of support. Extremely grateful. How about this aerial shot? Love it. It must be a drone, I believe, because I don't see any helicopters flying around here at the moment besides the NASA security one every now and then. I love the future. <laughs> we just have an automated drone casually circ circling a rocket on the pad with four humans in it. You know, no big deal. Real casual. The most amazing thing about this is it's not even the future, right? It's 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 now. I you love the now. It's the future. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Someone the future... in chat just said Das is in a paraglider. <laughs> <laughs> you joke. You joke, chat. I know, I know. <laughs> but do not underestimate Das and his willingness to put cameras in amazing places. He's not talking right now, so I'm nervous. Yeah. <laughs> He's up there with the alligator at the, in the helicopter. <laughs> He's installing a camera on an alligator. <laughs> in the sky. I was in tears because of the alligators on helicopters thing. I was, I was <laughs> sitting here. I was in tears. Thanks for that, by the way. <laughs> I missed that, um, but I'm 100% like here for, for the alligators. It was like the first 10 minutes of this stream. <laughs> wow, okay. I'm glad to know Did I, I didn't degrade the... Yeah, I did say alligators. <laughs> I think you've just coined a new term, alligators. <laughs> I'm I'm glad I didn't degrade the uh, the stature of the commentary here on the stream. I'm glad it was like <laughs> that from the start. Oh yes. <laughs> I I no longer feel bad for bursting in with a bad Oreo joke. Um, and pirates. <laughs> oh God, the pirates! A pirate alligator on a helicopter eating Oreos. There we go. Love it. Bringing it back. <laughs> It's there, it's gonna be merch. Just just wait. Um, <laughs> yes. Noted. That's all I say. <laughs> yes. Jeffrey Jeffrey S is asking: Are there technical reasons Dragon can't take a more direct trajectory to the ISS like Soyuz launches allow? What's going on there? Uh oh. Oh, did we lose Sawyer? I think we lost Dragon, Sawyer. you are go for section 7 of 4.100 to close visors and arm the launch escape system. All right. Right on time. SpaceX Dragon copies stepping into section 7. All crew visors are closed. We are arming the launch escape system. SpaceX copies all. Which means shortly we will begin our prop load. Excellent. Her excitement. I love her excitement. It's it really, it really is infectious in the best way. Um, Jeffrey, I'm going to put your question back in the queue so the smart people can answer it. Meanwhile, I will continue to make bad jokes. Um, Cruiser Frank, thank you for becoming a Capcom member. Once again, you get Discord access at that level, so... Pop into Discord and say hey. Stefan is asking, in the case of an in-flight abort, what will happen with the crew on the ISS since we don't have Russian seats anymore? Well, the crew for Dragon is still on the ISS it's right empty. now. I'm countdown one. Launch escape system is verified armed. Here we go. All right, 37 minutes and change. We're getting into the serious part of the count. Falcon 9 tanks will be venting for the start of prop load. Expect loud venting. It's crying. That's how you know it's crying. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I constantly think about what it must be like to be inside of Dragon 
during this phase of launch where the vehicle is coming alive and you're hearing valves open and close and just all of that sort of ambient sound i would i would really love to hear and feel what that's like someday astronaut training don't they actually have simulators where they pipe in the audio that they hear so that they're really prepared is that is that available to listen to did somebody like upload that illegally on youtube or something because i'd love to listen to that yeah somebody pirate that like someone at a fish concert or something let's just record it and upload it we'll (laughs) download it yeah put it on napster oh my god nasa space flight not responsible if you pirate nasa space flight not responsible if you pirate stuff from nasa yeah right uh (laughs) Yeah, oh my god, Napster and ShareBear and what were there's like there's so many of those random oh my god. LimeWire. Lime yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, not that I've ever used any of those services no. to do any no, who Never would do that? Who would, oh yeah. Who would do that? Not me. <laughs> no. Um to answer Jeffrey's question that we were asking a moment ago, Chris G in our back channel is saying, uh solar cells are a limiting factor. To how fast they can get to the ISS? I'm confused now. Sawyer, are you there? Mm, I, th- I think that was uh, related to back. the. I think that you... was related to the question about. Uh... Oh, it was related to abort. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. That's my bad, Chris. Sorry. Um, yeah, that's the Sawyer... limiting factor in terms of keeping Dragon aboard the ISS. Although, while it is up there and docked, it does take a lot of its power and everything, mostly from the ISS. It hardwire connects, but. Yeah, over time, those solar cells degrade and produce less power once it does undock. So I believe that is the main factor. I believe that's what Chris was talking about. Got it. Thank you for that, Sawyer. Uh, also, I'm going to ask you, why doesn't Dragon take Propellant a more loading direction? has started. Prop load has started. Oh. Let's go. I feel like I need a gong or something to hit. I don't, I don't know. I have to... <laughs> this Can is a big deal. That? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Sawyer, why doesn't Dragon take a more direct route to the ISS like Soyuz launches do? Uh, I think we were talking about this a little earlier. I believe it's because of uh, the Dragon is a little bit different from Soyuz. Uh, the Soyuz is obviously a lot more resilient in terms of being able to launch in any weather, whereas we're a lot more weather limited here. So if things were to scrub, uh, then it would impact crew sleep schedules on board the ISS. Uh, in addition, Dragon is a lot roomier than Soyuz, so you can get away with staying on board a little longer and not having to worry about being crammed between a whole bunch of packages, basically, and still being able to move around and float around and actually get some sleep in a sleeping bag kind of thing. So I believe that's a major factor out there. I didn't even think of that, but that makes sense. I mean, if if you are familiar with Soyuz at all, you should know that they have a little pokey stick that they use to operate some of the controls. Like, you're so, you're so cramped, you're so wedged in there that some switches and buttons literally you need a, a stick to be able to access and push um so yep, crew, the crew dragon, is that really what it's that's not what it's called the pokey stick pokey the stick. Term. So, yeah, i believe that's like, the english yeah. translation oh my god that's amazing <laughs> actually i would believe that i would absolutely believe that i love this fact that's my new favorite fact um, mm-hmm. let's see here Looking for another question. Here's one. Go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, we haven't really touched on this yet on the stream, but this particular mission is actually going to be doing a ton of science while they're up at the ISS, this crew. Um, They've got over 200 science experiments. Um, I don't know if, I guess this is kind of an okay time since we've got a little bit of time now where they're loading fuel. Um, but some of the stuff that they're doing, one of them is called cardio breath. So they're actually going to be wearing biomonitoring shirts that, um, track their heart rate, their blood pressure, their breathing rate, um, while they're exercising. And this is something that they're going to be using, um, to start just monitoring their biometrics a little bit more. They actually did this with crew four as well, but it's a different kind of, kind of like a scuba suit almost. Um, and it's going to be something that they're going to be using as they move forward to um, plan for, of course, like going to the moon. Um, Also, they're going to be doing something called Project Eagle, where um, they're using human heart cells. So they're actually doing a lot of 3D printing with um, heart cells. They're using tissue models 
um, and they're 3D printing them. And specifically, they've got these upgraded um, bio inks. So the printer heads that they're using now, they've got an upgraded version where they can stay cooler. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever used a 3D printer before here on Earth anyway, but they have like very picky opinions about the temperature. Um, so sometimes when it gets too hot, it can like kind of get rigid. Um, but if you've ever seen like, um, uh, oh gosh, now I can't remember the name of the show with the robots, uh, the Wild West robot show. What? The, the what the West West World West World that's the show. Sorry, oh. if you've ever seen the intro <laughs> for West World, that's the show, right? Uh, and it's like you know they're like three D printing bodies. That's essentially what it is. They're printing cell lines of uh, you know heart cells and cartilage cells, all this advanced um, bioprinting stuff with these cooled print heads. Um, so specifically, they're going to be looking at cell lines for cartilage cells. They're looking at printing three um, D printed knee cartilage tissue. It's going to be looking into uh, like because people tear their meniscuses, you know, all the time in the military. So yep. they're actually going to be looking into that um, and also to look towards arth osteoarthritis, which is a common issue. Um, and then also cardiac tissue samples um, for um, bioprinting. Stage one, um, cryohelium loading has started. And then they're going to be able to do tests um, on Earth with these um, cells to to look into things for heart conditions and medicines. Um, and specifically, the cool thing about the 3D printing in space, of course, with microgravity, it's very much more 3D. On Earth, you've got these bio inks that really sediment out. But um, by doing it in microgravity, you've got these much thinner layers that produce just a much better sample for them to bring back um, while they're cultivating it or culturing it. So. Um, you know, these are things people are always like, why are we wasting all this money launching people into space? Well, they're doing science that's very helpful here on Earth. Um, there's also another thing that they're doing, um, again, something similar they did with Crew 4, where um, they are um, 3D printing protein-based artificial retinas for um, patients with degenerative eye diseases like um, macular degeneration. So again, it's this idea of building up these multiple thin layers of protein um, to kind of help with overall uniformity of being able to 3D print these things in microgravity. Um, so really cool stuff. And then also actually on that topic as well, one of the JAXA science missions they're doing has to do with looking at liquids in microgravity. Obviously, we've all seen those amazing videos of, you know, them, you know, piping out water and chewing on water, you know, floating around and all that. Um, but they're actually now looking at controlling the conditions of microgravity a little bit more specifically. So to kind of simulate the gravity of the moon or of Mars, because this is going to help with, um, you know, thinking about fuel, right, on um, rovers and things like that and on our systems that we're going to need for exploration as we land on these other places um, and start living there regularly. These um, the, the liquids that they'll be using for you know, fuel or anything else moves differently in these different microgravity conditions. So they'll be observing that a bit as well. So there's a lot I'm of cool science going on. I'm loving all the science. I'm yeah. I'm getting breaking bad vibes and I just want to scream science and maybe some words I shouldn't say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's awesome. And and somebody just the other day was trying to tell me that uh, within our lifetimes there's a fair chance that you know, um, how should I put this? Uh, longevity extensions for human lifespan could very well become a thing and part of all of that you know potential medical breakthrough that might enable that is 3d printing of of cells and organs like that which you know this sort of study would would help advance the state of the art of so yeah cool. and not and not only that they've actually the one another one that they're doing um is studying specific gut microbiomes um that happen to change only in people who are in space so being able to study things um that will affect astronauts and just you know future space travelers as we have these longer and longer duration missions um they they have found that while you're in space the effects on your body actually really do mimic what happens with aging here on Earth as well. So being able to study their bodies in space will lend itself to helping to, you know, age, I guess, a bit more gracefully here on Earth too. So it's all related. Yeah, I mean, I've said it before on our streams. I'll say it many more times, surely. Uh, human Don't lifespans... Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> great movie. Uh, wait, Adrian, have you seen Airplane? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, I have seen Airplane. 
I feel like I need a bell. <laughs> I, like, I need to be ringing a bell right now. Like, yes! and get the gong out. <laughs> yeah, get the gong. <laughs> um, uh, go ahead. I, I really like the, the Leslie Nielsen uh, comedy movies. What a legend, so, right? Yeah. So, so yes, that's something I have seen, and not only once. I think to this day, my absolute favorite intro of any movie ever is uh, the either the Naked Gun or or um, police the police squad TV show that preceded it, like the the police cruiser like <laughs> driving through various situations with yes. like, a camera, a POV. Uh, just if you haven't seen it, go watch it. Anyways, aging. That's what Age, we were talking about. Yeah, aging. thank you. Uh, aging stinks, and so anything we can do to uh, forestall that and the ravages of time is a good thing. Mostly, I'm mostly grumpy about it because I want to see cool things happen in my lifetime. I'm sure everybody does. Uh, you know, we want to see humanity expand out into the solar system. We want to see, I don't know, all kinds of cool stuff. I want my flying car, darn it, and I want to live long enough for it to be a thing. So all for... Uh, any kind of research that might enable that. You can always strap you yeah, into just... a Tesla and launch you. I'm into it. I'm sold. <laughs> I really I have to, to say, in the, in, the, in the last year or so, my also my excitement shifted a lot more into these payloads. Stage and 2 cryo-helium loading like... has started. Okay. Um, because really with like also, things like James Webb, for example, you have these payloads that have such such wild goals and ambitions and, and can can deliver you so, so many things you don't know yet. And I, I always like when we talk about rockets, but I also really, really like if we talk about cool science payloads, cool experiments, um, because that's really, I mean, launches is one thing, right? But But doing something with these launches that's that's something else absolutely and like all the cubesats that are going to be going up with artemis eventually um when we were doing the tanking i, I was talking a bit about those as well i hope they get up there because there's going to be some really cool science that they're going to get from that as well yeah i hope uh they're not all just completely battery drained no. at the, at, when they yeah. finally get on orbit but to your to your point, Adrian, I, I completely agree. I mean, this, the science is super exciting. That's part of what makes rocket launches so cool and so exciting is the science that they enable, the learning that they enable. I I know everybody here in chat and in, in our in our in, on comms right now, like we like learning more about the solar system and universe that we inhabit, whether that's DART or James Webb or Hubble or any of these science missions. That is that is the stuff that is just so cool and so awesome to be able to expand human knowledge. Uh, so yeah, I'm all I'm all for the science. Maybe another merch idea, just a shirt that just says "All for the science." After the alligator eating Oreos on the alligator, uh, alligator. Yeah. <laughs> Twenty three minutes and forty seconds to go. We're coming up on launch. They have cryogenic helium in the first stage. We just heard a call out that they're loading cryogenic helium in the second stage. Fueling is underway. Clock is steadily ticking down. No weather issues. No dragon issues. No Falcon 9 issues. We are going to send people to space today. And we are just about three minutes away from the uh, iconic... Can I call it iconic? The iconic Falcon yes. 9 20-minute vent, which... When you see a lot of vapor coming from Falcon 9 here in a few minutes, do not stress. That is nominal. That is a normal part of the fueling process. Don't stress. I know it might be easy to stress because we're sending people to space, but everything's great. <laughs> Alex in our back channel says, historic T-20 minutes. Is it historic? Historic. <laughs> I feel like historic implies that something did something that then was retired, right? Like, I I feel like historic is more reserved for this did something and n does not do it anymore, right? It's one for the history books. The T-20 events. <laughs> Let's see here. Mark yes. Lamb, thank you for the support. They say, here's a contribution to the prop load gong fund. Is this a new Falcon 9 booster? Yes, this is a new booster, booster 1077. It is the one that hit a bridge while it was being transported, but no big deal. It was a minor issue. It's just kind of a fun fact to bring up, so I will do that repeatedly. I apologize. 
Uh, but yeah, this is a new booster. Shiny brand new booster with a cursed meatball. Further evidence that Team Worm is the right team. Don't at me. Cool. I will just leave that unchallenged. Moving on. Um, <laughs> we were talking earlier about whether a shot was coming from a drone or a helicopter. Snow Lane is saying there's a helicopter N44 2NA. Flight radar circling the pad. On flight radar circling the pad. So maybe that was a helicopter, not a drone. Either way, a cool shot. And Brett Newbert, thank you for the support. Uh, they got a metal broom from somewhere yesterday. It says American Broomstick in the worm font and has a molded dragon capsule on the end. I nice. saw that. Very cool. I saw that on Twitter or something. I want one of those. Also set that. up Starlink yesterday. Gotta love SpaceX. Indeed. Thank you for the support, Brett Newbert. We hope you enjoy your new things. And Moldy Space. Moldy Space Industries with hashtag Worm Gang. You're my people, Moldy Space. You are my right people. choice. Right choice. <laughs> I do sort of wonder if people in chat get grouchy at the amount that I am snarky about how the worm is so much better than the meatball. And I hope everyone takes it in good fun. But let's be real. Worm is better than meatball. Anyways, moving on. Moments away from that T-minus 20-minute event we were talking about earlier. And the crew is hanging out inside Dragon, happy and cozy and ready to go to space. Anna is definitely asleep. <laughs> after the question about if somebody is grumpy about you, like, uh, trashing the meatball and uh, promoting yeah. the worm, somebody in chat just said, yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pam says, no, we don't. And then someone Day else two, says, RP1 is... load is complete. Hey, there's it's a T-minus 20 minute event. RP1 load is complete. Like according, I said, that is... Uh, Go ahead, Adrian. According to the law that, that was established on this stream, the uh, rocket is not, right now sobbing. Or vaping, one of the mm. two. Yes. But either way, this is a nominal thing that we want to see as part of the prop loading process. All things nominal, and clock is ticking down. We are at 19 minutes and 30 seconds, roughly, Awesome. Let's send some people to space. Also, let's send some people to our merch store, how about? Maybe. Because we do have some awesome merch, and if you want to support what we do, that is the way to do it. There's the Super Chats, which we super appreciate. Haha, <laughs> super. There's also the membership program, of course. But if you want something physical in return for your support of NASA Space Flight, we have the merch store. We have all kinds of cool stuff. We've got Artemis merch. We've got Falcon 9 merch. We've got all kinds of awesome things that you can go and check out. What is? What are we typing in here? Aha. You can see all the sweet designs. There's mock diamonds. There's the human space flight design, which is lovely. I absolutely love the dragon capsule as the A. And of course, you know me, I love the worm font. You do? I I mean, come on! It's what? it's it's amazing. It's it's it gives me feels in the best we way. We have no idea. <laughs> so much snark, I love it. But yeah, the, there's some awesome designs. There, we even have. Speaking of broomsticks, a moment ago, we do have a broomstick centric design. I don't know if we can bring that one up on short notice. I'm putting Michael on the spot here, but uh, yep, here we go. You just type it right in. Brilliant. There you go. Maybe. Broomstick. A broomstick drone ship landing t shirt. I love it. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of sweet merch on the store. Whatever your dial is or whatever your favorite rocket or what have you, definitely go check out the merch store. And it's not just articles of clothing, there's also metal prints, which I would be remiss to not mention. Um, the metal prints are awesome and they're super easy to hang and mount on the wall. Anyways, that is the merch store. If you want to support what we do, go check out the merch store. We would super appreciate it. Here's a question from Pablo. They're saying, do astronauts on long-term missions cut their hair on the ISS? Like, shaving and hair cutting and all that, that's still something you hair. can do. Again, right? the hair. Bad yeah, idea, apparently. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a, it's a relevant question because there was a hair caught in the, in the hatch seal earlier. But Chris G in our back channel is saying, indeed they do. Of course, Chris G said indeed as part of his answer. They are vacuum cutters. 
which is giving me Wayne's World vibes. Uh, makes me think of the suck cut. That was Wayne's World, right? No. I'm not wondering, is there, a, is there like a limit? Is there like something where somebody says, okay, you cannot go to space if your beard is this long, for example? Ah, uh, poor Jack. That's, that's biased. <laughs> Actually, I yeah, read that, I, uh, speaking of haircutting, Anna, I think, cut Josh's hair uh, like a couple days ago while they were waiting for all of this to happen today. No kidding. I mean, I yeah, you wouldn't. Like I don't think were... you would want to go to space without you know, sort of looking your Day best. Day two locks load has started. They have tuxedos on underneath their suits. There, <laughs> Das is in the back channel saying, "I think they have a floby of sorts." <laughs> oh man! Oh, it's Koichi, not not uh, Josh. Thank you, Alex. Um, let's see here. Continuing with questions as we get closer and closer to launch. T minus just under 16 minutes now. Roseanne is saying, how about combining the worm and the meatball? Why not put the worm font inside the meatball? That is what we call the worm ball, and it is the most cursed of all NASA potential logos. And I love it. It's the worst. I it's, love it's it. Even, it's even worse than the meatball itself, somehow. It transcends awful. Why do you hate the meatball so much? You have, like, a lot of rage about this. I do. I have, I have issues with the meatball. You know, Why? I don't, okay, I don't hate it. It's not terrible. I, I like the meatball. The problem is, is I like the worm way, way more. And the reason why, I think, is because I was a kid in the 90s when, you know, that was still sort of a vibe with the shuttle program. Um, even though it was more of like an 80s thing itself, but I don't know. It's it's nostalgia. It's nostalgia and tribalism and stupidity. How about that? Well, I'll just throw myself under the bus. But if you I want nostalgia, like... wouldn't the meatball be the most nostalgic? That would be the like the original meatball, right? Because yeah. it's sort of like the meatball 2.0 now. Oh, that's there true. was a there was a meatball before the meatball. Well, it had like a planet on it or something, didn't it? Um, the original, the old old NASA logo. Yeah, I don't know. I just. I I really like the worm and the whole like the NASA standards guide for for the, like the graphic standards guide or whatever for usage of the worm was so comprehensive and well thought out um and it just it just was a cool look but anyways I think strong opinions about very useless things is a NASA <laughs> space flight actual thing I remember the preheat discussion now Oh don't let's not I'm Okay let's not bring that <laughs> Preheating is not a thing. Anyways, moving on. Um, yes, I agree. It's all just heating. Keith Carson, thank you for the support. They say instead of worm ball, it should be spaghetti and meatball. Well, now I'm hungry. Thank you, Keith. And thank you for the support. Um, Brian, uh, Brian V or Brian five is asking, how come they do not have the little oxygen boxes connected when they walk up to the rocket like the space shuttle used to those weren't just oxygen boxes those were like little ac uh like uh, is, is it safe to call them ac boxes mm -hmm. it's like a little like a, like you carried your own air conditioning unit in that era and now they don't I, i'm not sure what the logic is there perhaps just not needed technology has improved yeah right Let's see. Looking for some more questions. People in chat have really latched on to the Floby. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I, I mean, hey. Uh, the Warren versus Meatball discussion also is like a subplot still going on in the chat. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm always surprised how long that sometimes takes. It will never end. Yeah, I... I'm not sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm also not sorry for constantly starting that fight in chat. My bad. <laughs> uh, let's see. It's David James is asking, what would happen if something went wrong with the Falcon rocket during the countdown? Would the Dragon Abort come into effect? Yes. yes. That, the launch escape system is armed. And if anything goes wrong at this point, Dragon will abort off of Falcon 9 and everything should be fine.
Let's see. Have so they scared. set upload complete yet? I don't think we should so. Be coming up on that soon, I think. Right? Yeah, oh, no, we'll we have, have like to... ten minutes left. Right. Well, we'll we'll keep listening for more callouts because we are we are continuing to get that, and I will endeavor to not talk over wow. them. I will endure to not talk over. Them? I don't know. Endurance. Ha -ha. Yeah. Thank you. Endeavor. Enterprise. What? <laughs> <laughs> um. Let's see. I can't believe we are only 12 minutes away at this point like the, it i don't know close to a crew launch there's always a moment where it kicks in where you're like okay we are they are launching crew in about mm -hmm. yeah a bit more than 10 minutes which is like i feel like it's a yay, roller coaster it's like they walk out they start loading in and i'm like oh i'm nervous oh my gosh oh my gosh and then you're just kind of like okay we're just like waiting now and you know they're falling asleep inside the capsules and then it kicks in again in these like last 10 yeah. minutes yeah it it's surreal. It really is. And as much as I like to joke around, it is a serious thing. We are sending humans into space in just under 11 minutes. And it's a momentous occasion. Anytime you're launching crew into orbit to the ISS or otherwise, it's, it's, I mean, it's like the pinnacle of human achievement, right? It's one of the hardest things we know how to do. And for a while there, it's not something we could even do ourselves. We had to partner with other countries and it's just nice to see that we have this capability again. It's nice to see that it's sort of becoming more and more routine. Uh, but at the same time, as it becoming more routine and, and sort of, you know, something that we're, we're used to as opposed to when we were just starting off with dragon flights and, and crewed flights from the U S again, it's uh Dragon, it's SpaceX. nonetheless confirm crew displays are configured for launch. Yoko, we would like to give a huge thanks to the NASA and SpaceX team, the thousands of people for their development, preparation and training in getting endurance and crew fire to the launch pad today, and your continued support in helping to make this a successful mission. We look forward to joining the rest of our Expedition 68 crew members aboard the International Space Station. And a special thanks on behalf of all the crew to our family and friends. It is your love and support that help make dreams come true. Now let's do this. Crew 5 displays are configured for launch. I love it. Really, uh, let's just... do this. Nicole, Josh, <laughs> Koichi, and Anna. On behalf of the entire team at SpaceX, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. Nice. We even got a Godspeed out of it. I love it. Not just under nine minutes to go until launch. I'm just, let's do this. Let's send people to space. Let's continue also, the legacy. Side note to the previous topic. Yeah, imagine living in a country that has not access to a crew capsule. Couldn't be me, right? Soon, my buddy. Soon. Give it time. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. I'm like, I'm honestly just a little bit frazzled right now. This is happening. We are eight minutes and 30 seconds to go. Now is not the time for jokes. Now is the time for seriousness. Let's send yes. some people to space. I am looking for a couple more questions. It got so serious now. No more jokes. I mean, there could be a couple. There could be a couple. Uh, somebody, oh, I missed it. Somebody in chat said the screens are configured for launch equals they have NSF stream on, which thank you for that, <laughs> whoever, whoever that was. Sorry I missed your name. There, okay. See, it's not all seriousness. But for real, seven minutes and 30 seconds to go. Dustin's asking, what is the round structure to the right of the launch pad? It's near the new orbital launch pad. It's that, that silver tank looking thing on the right. We think that's an, a liquid oxygen tank. It's, it appears to be a double walled cryogenic tank. And uh, we're thinking it's liquid oxygen. Coming up here at seven minutes is the Falcon 9 engine shell. 
Excellent. Hopefully, engine three gets down. Wait, nope. Different rocket. Oh, Stage one. Oh my god. Kill. Started. There you go. You heard the call out. Stage one engine chill started. David Edwards in chat says the trampoline is go. The broomstick is go for launch. Is it a, is it a trampoline or a, a broomstick? No, or both? It's a broomstick on a trampoline. Okay, okay. Don't another, it home. The trampoline thing is another Ros, Ros Cosmos, uh, Ros Cosmos reference, I think, right? Or Rogozin. Um, Johan in chat asking, did they check the staging? I sure hope they did. That's a good Kerbal joke there. Stage one, RP one load is they complete. Check. I feel confident somebody checked the staging before launch. What was that call out? Uh, locks load complete? Yes. Excellent. All things tracking towards launch. Yep. Oh, it was, and R was RP1 that... load complete. Sorry. And the next thing that should happen is at five minutes that Dragon transitions to internal power. You said it happens when? Five minutes before T0. All right, so just uh, about 30 seconds from now. You can see Falcon 9 is venting. You can see the condensation coming off of the super chilled propellants in the first and second stage. The vehicle is alive and getting Falcon ready to go. Falcon 9 tank will be pressurizing for strong back retract. Perfect. Here we go. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how you feel, guys, right now, but uh, but I feel like at this point, yeah, I'm nervous. Always, I, I'm I cannot deny. Dragon that. is in. Configure yeah, excited, for terminal count. I'm lacking the word here. I'm excited, but it's always it, it's crew. It's it's a crew launch. That's uh, that's always something different. Yeah, Cautiously Chris... enthusiastic. I like that. I like that. <laughs> I, I I I steal that. <laughs> Okay. It's like even better than cautiously optimistic. It's cautiously, <laughs> cautiously enthusiastic. enthusiastic. I like it. I do like that. Chris B in our in our chat says uh, he always feels nervous. I see. I'm kind Strong of of a different different mentality where hmm. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm if I was on Dragon, I would certainly be nervous. But I'm I feel comfortable right now. I mean, certainly it's very excited. Uh, but I feel like if anything untoward were to happen, the crew should be fine. We know that. Um, the Dragon capsule has abort capability all the way to orbit. We know that SpaceX has dotted their I's and crossed their T's, and I'm not too worried about it. Everything will be fine, whatever happens. That's also something, like, to feel not super nervous about something feels like an accomplishment of all the, the pre-testing they did and all this launch abort testing they did. Um, yeah, that's part of the, the good safety measures they, they implemented with this capsule. Definitely uh, still extremely exciting, though, with three minutes and 30 seconds to go. You can see the claw has opened up, and now the strong back will begin to retract. Gosh, that looks cool. That's a great shot. Look at all that construction behind it. Jeez. Yeah, Starship Pad in Florida is really coming along nicely. Up on three minutes. Stage one locks load is complete. There's your locks load complete. Excellent. And so, just noting that liftoff is at 12, 12 p.m. in 57 seconds. So, not Dragon at the is top in terminal the count and is on internal power. All right. Dragon's on internal power. Everything's tracking towards launch. Two minutes, 30 seconds to go. So yeah, once again, 12, 12 o'clock and 57 seconds. So not 12.01, not 12 on the button, but 12 and 57 seconds. One minute. To give like a, like a preview of what will happen at the end, at about one minute before lift of the... Falcon 9, a launch uh, the flight computer will take over, and uh, Falcon 9 will be in startup. 
And at 45 seconds, about that, um, sometimes it's a bit earlier, a bit later, the, hopefully the launch director verifies the final go for launch before the rocket then will lift off. So that's what we are looking at in the next about two minutes. Dragon is in auto idle. Now. Stage two locks load is complete. There you go. That venting is nominal. Yeah, it's cool. Out. The T-minus right, starting. Event. Expect loud venting. That is the final purge of the lines on the transporter erector. All right. Coming up on a minute to go. Godspeed Crew 5. Let's do this. FTS is armed. Falcon 9 is in startup and is now controlling. Dragon is in countdown. Offer launch should come up very soon. Dragon SpaceX. Godspeed. Go for launch. SpaceX Dragon, go for launch. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 15. 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. Engine's full power. And lift off. Go crew five. Stage one alpha. Copy one alpha. Vehicle is pitching downrange. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Throttle down. Bravo. Copy, one Bravo. Impact chill has started. There you have it, chill on the second stage has started. Dragon and Falcon 9 piercing the clouds and heading into space. Beautiful. And Trey, Trey Porthos in chat saying it quite eloquently, surfing an explosion. I love it. <laughs> Nicole Mans, and I gotta, uh, I gotta say, the, the pad audio, amazing. Like, definitely. Killing it out there in the field, you guys. So we are coming up on Miko, right? Stage Adrian? one, throttle down. Uh, we are coming up on Miko, which will happen at 2 minutes and 36 seconds. So, very soon. A couple things will happen in rapid succession. The, the booster and second stage will separate, second stage will start up its engine, and the booster will uh, reorient itself. And Here we Miko. go. Stage 2 Alpha. Stage separation confirmed. Copy, 2 Alpha. I'll never get tired of this view. 
I know we said this before, but her excitement is so... It's it's getting everywhere because it's... Uh, I love it's it. getting everywhere. <laughs> it really is. It's, it's amazing. A... You can hear it for sure. Yeah. There go the grid fins You're... deploying on the first stage in preparation for it uh, re-entering the atmosphere and providing some control authority to it. Second stage continuing with its burn, powering Dragon into orbit. You can see the velocity slowly ticking up. Three minutes and 23 seconds into launch. Now, if you see um, some objects fl floating around or flying by on the right side on the second hand stage, the second stage view, don't worry, it's probably ice. It's a really common thing that we see uh, during this phase of the of flight. Gosh, and I just love the views from the booster as it reorients itself and prepares to make a landing. Which will happen about about nine minutes and 30 seconds after liftoff that's uh, hope that's the plan they are they are having here and it's uh going to a drone ship right yes they they are going downrange to a drone ship because um they cannot uh, they ha don't have the performance in these missions to go uh return to launch site so they will land on the drone ship which will be uh, just read the instructions Well, NASA certainly read the instructions today, and so did SpaceX, They're making it look almost easy. Did someone scoff? I heard a scoff. No. What? No. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it as well. <laughs> Velocity is over 10,000. Uh, I can't see that. It's, the preview is too low res. Velocity is climbing. 10,600 and climbing. Okay. So the first stage will continue to get closer and closer to Earth and re-enter the atmosphere, while the second stage will continue to power the crew into orbit. Everybody's letting me know it's kilometers an hour. Thank you. I, I figured it was kilometers of something. I guess kilometers an hour makes the most sense. Next up will be the first stage entry burn, which uh, is about 90 seconds from now. So that's uh, where the, the first stage will slow itself down before it re-enters into the atmosphere. Excellent. It's amazing how these shots have gotten so much better over time. Just the clarity. Yeah. And just like that engine bell is just so cool. I mean, I I think it goes a long way. It, it might seem, yeah. you know, like people might take it for granted or people might not necessarily appreciate it as much as they maybe should. Like some launch providers at this at this stage of flight, you'd be getting like a 3D a 3D representation of the yeah. of the rocket or you know even worse you be getting like talking heads in a studio or something like the fact that we can see this so clearly and so well is part of what gets people excited about all of this stuff it's not just some you know CGI thing that we're like yeah yeah it's going to space it's like no look 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 right now everybody look yeah. at the left side of the screen yeah. That booster is firing its engines. You can see the Earth getting bigger and bigger in frame as it falls back towards the the water there, and uh, and does its entry burn. Like you can see it. It's it's so much better than uh, you know some other launch providers that might not prioritize these types of views and improving these types of views over time. It's really I really appreciate it. But 
Surprise, surprise. Jack, the camera guy, likes good cameras. <laughs> before, before giving you the next timeline update, I just want to say, yes, it goes a long way, uh, Jack, as you said, because it actually goes to space. Stop so it. I just wanted to get that up. Sorry. Oh, um, <laughs> I saw <laughs> it coming. Up. <laughs> I saw it coming, and I, I didn't do anything to stop it. And I am, I am beha on behalf of NASA Space Flight, everybody <laughs> watching, I apologize. Anyways, Adrian, what's the next timeline item? At eight minutes and forty nine seconds, uh, second the second stage will actually cut off for uh, yeah being done with its uh, burn. So uh, that's the, the next thing. Up in a few seconds, actually. Yep, and once that's done, that's uh, where where the second stage done its job. And how long after that until uh, Dragon Sep? The Dragon separation is planned for twelve minutes after T zero. All right, let's keep an eye on the first stage here. We're probably going to get some awesome views as it comes down back through the clouds and attempts a landing on Just Read the Instructions. Oh, oh it heard me. <laughs> Jinx it. Yeah, my bad. It got nervous. You can see the indicator there, the landing burn has started. There, oh, there we go. Oh, here we go. There's the drone ship. Steady. Steady. Legs. Give me some legs. Oh, oh. That's amazing. Not even centered. Oh, different. I mean, still, though, making it look easy. Different angle, though. Usually we, usually we see that shot as it's coming down. Interesting. Nice little treat there. Adrian, I, I, know, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I'm still going to call that uh, bullseye. I'm joking, of course, here, just uh, just to point <laughs> that out. That's still amazing. I, I love it. But uh, we, we sometimes joke that they got so accurate here. I mean, you're right. A lot of times they hit like the dead center of that inner circle. Um, you know, small perturbances in the atmosphere as they're coming back in. Who knows? Either way, it looked like a great landing. It'll be a little choppy out there. Some of the remnants of... Uh, oh, yeah, good point. There, too. And just to point it out, we have four people here in space. Thank you Fan for the reminder. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I just because we're talking about landing rockets, I was like, oh, there's also four people now there's in this also. capsule in space. <laughs> That's true. It is a good reminder, though, because usually we're watching, you know, Starlinks go up or something like that. Robots and machines. Is that a trunk view there? Again with the trunk. Oh yeah, we have, uh, as Crypt Scapard points out in the back channel, we have seven on the ISS now, three on Tiangong, and we have four here. So, that's, 14 people that's, are in space right now. Yes, that's, that's a cool number. <laughs> Jewel1234 in chat just saying meat launch in all caps i mean i guess that's the opposite of a starlink launch i don't i don't i don't know what you're going for jewel one two three four but whatever it is go for it i like the bungee cords on that you see those two like little oh i missed it oh, i'm gonna have to look next time Turtle to show that that pressure. angle what the, that uh, like, separate... what are we looking at here Looks like wires, like wires that are secured. Oh, wires. It looks like the hooks on a bungee cord. Kind it does. Of, isn't it? <laughs> it totally does. I 100% I see that. The separation of the, the dragon from the second stage should come up immediately. And after that, the, yeah, the, the rocket done the job, right? All right, let's stand by and watch out for that. And there you go. Here it goes. That is absolutely sci-fi. It really is. Dragon Copter again. Dragon Mitsu, launch director on Dragon, on behalf of the entire launch and recovery team, it was an honor and a pleasure to be a part of this mission with you. And while October 3rd may belong to the Mean Girls, October 5th will forever belong to Crew 5. Godspeed endurance. Cheers. Awesome, thank you so much to the Falcon team. Woo!
did they just reference Mean Girls? I think what a, so. <laughs> what a what a throwback! Wow. I have to Google that. I yeah, obligatory. I thought, said, I thought he said the main girls at first, and then I think I think that's what that was. That was the joke of October third. Not yeah. too hot, not too cold. Just wear a light sweater. <laughs> oh man, I haven't watched that movie in forever. Adrian, I'm I. You haven't seen Mean Girls, I assume, right? Just no, of ask. course not. It's oh, in my contract. No. I have to ask. I wait. I totally made a Mean Girls reference during the tanking one. We were talking about like the limit of the number of times you could do something, and I was like, "Oh yeah, the limit does not exist." And I was it's like silence on the other end, and I'm oh. like, "Come on, guys!" Oh. And the people in the chat were like, "Oh, you made him do that." Well, now you're a Mean Girls fan. Thanks. Where were you then? We gotta we gotta update our. We gotta make sure we're up to date on our movie references here. We have homework <laughs> to do. Is that like an NSF movie reference list that you need to know? Like, I need oh, like that, an overview. Is that our zero G indicator there? What is that? Oh, it's a glove. What is it? Oh, it's a glove. No, it what like is a, it? No, no it's, oh, it's, no, it's Einstein. Einstein. It looks like a little Albert Einstein. It does oh, look like it, their glove, doesn't it? <laughs> please let it be Albert Einstein. I think that's what it is. It looks relative relatively like uh, oh. I don't know I don't know sorry <laughs> look at that oh. that shot was like something out of 2001 I love it I love that Chad is on like a 20 second delay because I can make a bad joke continue on with things and then glance over at youtube chat and just see like a thousand people collectively groaning <laughs> yeah i love that it's the somebody best after making out, a bad joke somebody pointed out uh it's wednesday but they're not wearing pink <laughs> i am is that another me i'm completely it's a mean girls reference oh, oh my God. come on i'm i oh am fail God. i am a failure now you know how it feels <laughs> <laughs> I have I have made my bed. I will lay in it. Awesome. Well, four people are in space and headed to the ISS. We were talking about it earlier. It was a, what a twenty nine hour transit to the ISS. Twenty nine hours. That's right. All right. Well, twenty eight in forty five minutes. Now we are coming up on sixteen minutes into the launch here. Dragon and the Trunk have separated from the second stage and are on their way. Gotta love it. I'm just, what a great launch. The enthusiasm was palpable. And I love that shot. Thank you, everybody, for watching along with us. Let's run through some more of these Super Chats because I do want to make sure we, we uh, show everyone our appreciation for their support. Uh, Fosco, thank you so much. For the support, the chemical composition of the 20-minute vape is liquid oxygen. Uh, or maybe it's liquid nitrogen. BJ Turon, thank you for the support. They like the worm ball. I do not, but you do you. Um, it's fun to see all the super chats that are from previous uh, veins of discussion. Clearly, these are all from when we were talking about Meatball versus Worm. Coltonstein, thank you for the support. They say, Meatball, Worm, what about the old yellow logo on the X-15s? I mean, that is absolutely classic. You're not going to hear me arguing about that at all. I think those were on the SR-71s as well. Um, Mark Siskio, Sik Sikuso, sorry for butchering your name there, Mark. Thank you for the support. They say, love a double launch day. Great coverage as always. That's right. We have a Falcon 9 launch from Vandenberg later today. Jim Cavett, thank you for the support. They say, for the worm. Roseanne DeVasto talking about getting their Flowbee in 1980 <laughs> and still <laughs> using it. That's amazing. Surprised it still works. Uh, Tommy Vasky, thank you for the support. Making a joke about the silly logo discussion and hand shoot Han hand shooting first. Um, shot first. Oh my god! That's he did. He shot. He, no, he shot first. Anyone that wants to tell me, including George Lucas, that he didn't, I'm just like sorry. Go away. Uh, Ephraim, thank you for becoming a Padrat member. G W, older but not wiser. Thank you for becoming a red team member. 
Mike, thank you for the support. They say Falcon 9 having become this reliable is just mind-boggling. I am so here for Falcon 9's reliability. I'm so glad Falcon 9 exists. Lawrence Rangers, or no, Lawrence Rogers, my apologies. Thank you for the support. They say great coverage today, y'all. Thank you. Thank you for the support. We will keep making these. You keep watching them. I said, I'll say it again. We'll keep making them. And 714 Metal Detecting, thank you for the support. They say, not much, but thanks for all you guys and gals do. Doesn't have to be a lot. Doesn't even have to even be a monetary contribution. You can hit the like button, and we really appreciate that, just as much as the monetary contributions. It all goes towards helping us do what we do. And uh, to close these out, Laverne Taylor becoming a pad rat. Thank you so much for the new membership there. Thank you to all of our new members from the stream. If you came in at Capcom and above, pop into Discord and say hey. And I will send you my customary Forrest Gump waving gif. I know, huge uh, incentive there. Um, and at this point, I don't know if we have visuals of it, but the nose cone would be opening. Alrighty, well, I think with that, we will wrap things up. Dragon is on its way to the ISS. Four additional humans in space compared to just over 20 minutes ago. What a great day. Mm -hmm. Always amazing to watch a crude launch. For or real. any launch, really. But, but especially the crude launch. Yeah. Especially Bart, but especially Lisa. That's a Simpsons reference. All right. I think with that, we'll uh, wrap things up. You don't have to go, but you can't stay here. But what you can do is go hang out at Starbase Live, or sorry, Space Coast Live. That is our 24-7 live stream of all things Kennedy Space Center. Or if you want, if you're more of a Starbase person, go hang out at Starbase Live. We've got 24-7 live streams for whatever you want to watch, including McGregor Live for tests of SpaceX's engines out in Texas. But with that, thank you to everybody that was on commentary today. I think we will wrap it and hang out at Space Coast Live. Have a good one, everybody. All right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We have the dog. Propulsion continues to be normal. Pressure looks good. Probably not. Water towers can fly! Yes! Ego down to nominal. Why not try SCE doll? Bring in SCE doll. Oh. Yikes. You bet. Incur. We don't need any more of these.